All right, welcome everyone. We have a quorum present. It continues to be Wednesday, September 29th, 2021. This is a meeting of the Committee of the Whole of the Bloomington Common Council. We have seven pieces of legislation to work on tonight, including four ordinances and three appropriation ordinances. Uh, each of those will include opportunities for council questions and public comment as well. Uh, I believe we are getting started with some comments from Mayor Hamilton. Is that correct? Yes. <laughs> there you are. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you very much. I will be brief. I won't repeat myself. Um, I do want to give you two quick news items. One, uh, we just shared with City Council and the public the mid-year budget goals report for 2021 familiarly known as the Trello reports, uh, reporting on how we're doing on this year's budget, uh, which I'm sure you'll enjoy, uh, extensive document. And second, I want to, I'll just note, you'll be meeting tonight the incoming general manager of Bloomington Transit, uh, John Connell, uh, and I, we welcome John, and of course, we'll be celebrating Blue May's 24 year service, uh, uh, which concludes tomorrow with retirement. So just wanted to share that news. Just to recap, um, we're of course presenting a $107 million civil city budget, $179 million total budget, including ancillary uh, departments. I wanna thank all of the staff of the city from cabinet to all 850 plus uh, members of the staff who've done extraordinary work this past year, continue to do so. Uh, I wanna thank the council members in particular, and of course, also the public and many other institutions for your input on this budget, uh, beginning formally in April and continuing through August, through September, all of which has improved this budget, uh, including things since August presentation. Uh, this is an unprecedented budget, investing in the pandemic recovery we're still in, uh, as well as advancing uh, our interests and values toward climate responsibility and equity. Um, we continue our strong support of our city staff with a two and three quarter percent pay raise across the board for, for the civil city non-union folks, others under their contract, continue the 1.5% of payroll committed to training. We, we, as you know, in the budget have a $500 one time to all city employees uh, reflection from the CARES Act, uh, primarily reflecting their great work over the last year and also adding a family uh, paid family leave program for the first time ever. Um, it is the American Rescue Plan Act uh, and the Recover Forward $10 million uh, investments toward climate and inclusion and recovery forward that really are extraordinary uh, valuable in this budget to help us invest in unprecedented ways in affordable housing, in job recovery, in the arts, in infrastructure, particularly climate related, and of course, revenue recovery as well. Uh, this budget also keys on the basics, uh, the basic services that we, we have and will continue to provide to our community, especially public safety. You'll recall we had 16 plus new funded positions in the public safety world, uh, primarily in the uh, Bloomington Police Department. Uh, and uh, the overall budget's focus on the basics, on, on climate sustainability and on equity and inclusion, uh, I'm very proud to continue to bring to you. Let me just summarize very quickly changes since the four nights in August and the presentation key aspects of those. Significantly, uh, mostly increasing public safety investment uh, with a particular focus on retention and recruitment investments enhanced at the Bloomington Police Department. Uh, since that August presentation, we have added $400,000 more of American Rescue Plan Act money uh, to support retention and recruitment. We are uh, planning and indicating in the budget to provide $5,000 per sworn officer up to the sergeant rank uh, to uh, help retain uh, the staff that we have and recruit new. We are enhancing leadership pay in the department pursuant to earlier recommendations from salary studies. And we are commencing this next month in October salary negotiations with the uh, Fraternal Order of Police representing 
the police department uh, sworn officers. Um, adding to the already unprecedented investments in sustainability and equity. Also, since August, we are adding pilot programs on a downtown parking city employee cash out program to try to reduce single use of automobiles. Uh, and we're adding a pilot program to cr create public restroom access 24-7 uh, around the clock. We are going to continue to work together going forward. Uh, again, I think the budget has been strongly enhanced and improved from April uh, through the summer, through August, through September with comments and suggestions and reviews. Um, I'll close by noting that I do not doubt that everyone could find something they'd like to change in this budget. I don't doubt that. It requires a balance to put a budget together among many, many obligations, many opportunities. It involves trade-offs. Uh, I strongly believe that this in front of you is an excellent budget that incorporates the values of our community and moves us through tough times that we're in still, protecting our workforce and protecting our community and also advancing us purposefully, proactively toward a better, more sustainable and more equitable future. I want to thank you all for your input and your involvement. I want to thank you in advance for your consideration of this budget. And I respectfully urge you to support this budget for 2022. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Hamilton. Um, what is the will of the council? We'll have time for during each piece of legislation for questions and discussion. Would folks like an opportunity to ask the mayor questions now as well? Crickets. Okay, let's just dive right into legislation then. Um, just an introductory comment um, on behalf of our controller and the mayor and council. The public here, the public comment period on appropriation ordinance 2102 and 2104 will be serving as the required public hearing on the city budget and the transit budget. Uh, so that is coming up. We are looking first at ordinance 2139, an ordinance to amend ordinance 20-22, which fixed salaries for officers of the police and fire departments for the year 2021 regarding pay grade changes for police lieutenants and captains, additional pay and retention pay. And I believe we have Ms. Shaw with us. Ms. Shaw, please go ahead. Good evening, council members. My name is Caroline Shaw, I'm the HR director here. This evening, I'll be. this will be the first of four ordinances I present to you this evening. The first is ordinance 2139, which amends ordinance 2022, which fixed the 2021 salaries of our officers first class Offers of the police and fire departments. There are two grade changes in the police portion of this amendment. They are for the, for the lieutenants, which will go from an eight to a nine, and the captains, which will increase from a nine to a 10. These new pay grades will provide the flexibility to pay personnel in these positions higher base salaries. Supervisory officers with non contractual salaries and who are previously eligible for extra pay above their pace. Pay, base pay will receive pay increases. They will no longer be also be eligible for extra pay. And supervisory sergeants, officers, first class, and senior police officers will receive an additional $1,000 in retention pay during the fourth quarter. Your approval of this ordinance is requested. I'm happy to take your questions at this time. Thank you. Let's come to council for questions. Council member Piedmont Smith. Yes, thank you, Ms. Shaw. Um, as this uh, deals with 2021 salaries, are the changes going to be retroactive? They are. They, they, um, the, uh, once you approve the ordinance on October 13th, we'll immediately take action and make the police supervisor increases, uh, make that retroactive back to January 1st of 2021. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Additional questions? Council Member Sandberg. Thank you. Um, the uh, supervisory positions that are under the captains and the lieutenants, the sergeants, 
Can you explain um, why they are not going to be considered in the same category? And it sounds like they're going to be getting the bonuses, this fourth quarter 1,000 stipend, which are bonuses. Is, is, can you just explain the differences? Because we, of course, on council, we're concerned about everyone in a supervisory capacity that had more leadership responsibility, uh, understanding that those adjustments it, were really a little bit lagging behind when perhaps those could have been um, issued. Councilmember Sandberg, I may not completely understand your question, but let me let me tell you what I, clarify what I think you may be asking, and then you can tell me where what I've missed if that's okay. So uh, okay. all the all supervisors, supervisory sergeants and above. I don't think I have the ordinance right here in front of me, but I can find it. Lieutenants, captains, supervisory sergeants, the deputy chief, anyone I'm missing who's a supervisor in the, the, on that list. Um, gets the the market adjustment that they are they are due for, and that they will be um, effective. Like I said, back at January first of this year. Mm -hmm. I am not. Uh, maybe uh, Mr. Underwood, if if that's your question, why? So um, does that answer your question, Council Member well, Sandberg? <laughs> yeah, it is. It is just a little bit confusing. Again, this okay. business of fourth quarter incremental, you know, $1,000. And I see Mr. Underwood is waving his I hand. I was in. hoping he would turn his camera on and wave his hand. Thank you. Thank uh, you, Mr. Underwood. Yes, Jeff Underwood, <laughs> city controller. Um, I think I understand the question is, the salary adjustments for the uh, three positions that we're talking about, deputy chiefs, captains, and lieutenants, uh, are a market adjustment. When we looked at the supervisory sergeant's pay, uh, it was in line um, with the salary study. So we elected to go ahead and give them the $5,000 retention bonus. So they will not be a part of the uh, retroactive pay. However, their salary is in line with what the salary study showed us. Uh, and we elected to go ahead and give them the, the um, $5,000. Thank you. And if I can follow up again, does this help with the compression gap? Brings Abs them up absolutely. So that yes. future future bargaining and future raises will not be, um, you know, I, I don't want to use the word punitive, but we want to encourage people to step up and take those leadership positions. Absolutely. So uh, we, I've mentioned to the, uh, the group, uh, negotiation group that, and the mayor as well, that any adjustments that we make via the contract would be looked at in a line with the supervisor, those seven positions and the chief to make sure that we do have adequate um, gaps in those so that it does uh, encourage people to be promoted. And we have that issue throughout the city. So we, we pay a lot of attention to all of that. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, additional questions. Seeing none, let's go to public comment. Um, just by way of reminder or, or by way of mention, uh, if you would like to offer public comment at this time, uh, please use the raise hand function in Zoom. Or if you like, you can type a message in chat to our meeting host to let him know that you would like to speak. Um, if you have more than one individual speaking from one device, uh, please let us know that so we can ensure that everybody has sufficient time. Um, I would suggest we start with up to three minutes per uh, speaker, are there any objections to that? Okay, Mr. Lucas, do we have any public commenters? I'll just remind anyone that would like to comment that uh, to find the raise hand button, you, you may need to click either the participants button, the more button, or the reactions button in your control panel. Uh, if you're here calling in on uh, a phone, you may need to dial star nine. And if all of that fails, please use the chat feature if you're able to, to let us know you'd like to comment. And I don't see any hands going up at the moment. Let's give it another moment. Okay, seeing none, let's come back to council. Councilmember Volan. I actually have a question. Um, I'm not sure I, and I mean, I, I'm with Councilmember Sandberg and that I'm not sure I entirely understand uh, the impact of this, which we just got uh, this afternoon. Um, so the, in the section 2B, 
or the one C of the or of the uh, of the ordinance uh, is the pay simply one time additional pay or ongoing additional pay, a permanent raise in the base salary of every officer. Can someone from the administration answer that question? I will try. Um, so the supervisors are we will be bumped up. Their base pay is bumped up significantly. Okay, and wait, wait, wait. So I see that, uh, yeah, captain and lieutenant have both gone from up one level, one grade. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we didn't we didn't have to adjust the other grades uh, right. for Boland because they were right. already sufficiently sufficient ranges to okay. encompass the increases. Okay. But as far as the uh, section 2B, additional pay for senior police officers, et cetera. Is that one time or a permanent increase in base pay? Mr. Underwood, do you want to help me out here? I, so um, I, I will try to, Joe, Jeff. I, I can answer it. For, <laughs> the, for the sworn officers, the supervisory sergeants and below, uh, these are uh, five one-time payments that are not permanent adjustments to their base. The retention okay. pay is what we're referring to. That's where I okay. didn't understand you were talking about. I'm sorry, the retention pay, yes. Okay, um, but it's uh, it's up to the, the administration and the union to negotiate a new contract starting. Are, are, you, are you bringing the process forward some? I thought it started in 2022, the negotiation. Yes, we're starting starting the negotiations early for the contract that would begin with one one twenty three, in the hopes that we can have an agreement uh, prior to the calculation of the budget, so that um, if there is a need for additional revenues, obviously the council uh, we would approach the council uh, for support uh, to okay. increase those revenues. Thank you. Thank you. Additional questions. Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Yes, so um, I'm trying to understand. So there, there's uh, a, a few things happening here. Uh, so I understand the $1,000 in retention pay. And we'll talk about additional retention pay when we get to the 22 budget. And then the grade changes. Now, do the grade changes for lieutenants and captains result in an increase in base salaries? or is the only increase in base salaries um, the employees who were previously eligible for extra pay? The great, oh, Jeff. For, for the, the seven positions that we're talking about, so cap, deputy chief, captains, and lieutenants, these are permanent increases in the pay uh, for the officers that are in or would be in those positions. The grade changes allow us the maximum uh, in order to provide those. So those will be made, once the ordinance is approved, we will calculate the amounts and it will be retroactive to 1-1-21. One, one, uh, and then they would get uh, the two and three quarters percent increase on top of that for 2022. Okay, so um, I'm just looking at Ms. Shaw's memo. So the pay grade, changes from eight to nine and from nine to 10 that result in, oh, they just provide the flexibility for higher salaries. And then the next paragraph talks about the actual increase in salary. Yes. Is that it? Okay. Yeah, because since they're non-union, non they fall into the um, classifications for non-union employees, which uh, are get grades uh, up to grade 12, which are department heads. So these are nines and tens. Uh, movements that have range that go with those. So that change, it moves them into those ranges that have a wider range that allows us sufficient uh, room in that range to make these payments. And then um, follow-up question, and this may have been maybe what Council Member Sandberg was asking about too, and I apologize if I'm repeating, but um, the pay increase for those supervisors is that more than they would have gotten with the previous base pay plus the extra pay? Yes, because it moves them up to create uh, 
it, we have a compression issue now with those salaries, so it will move them up. And then as we negotiate for the union contract, as I noted, we would also make adjustments to keep that separation in those grades so that we don't have that, we're not gonna create this problem again with the new contract. So there will be adjustments made for 2023 that keeps that gap. And having the pay grades gives us that flexibility. So we're not having to uh, do a specific ordinance amendment every time we need to do that. Right, and I just wanna make sure that these supervisory positions they're still getting a better deal than they would have with their current salary plus what's considered extra pay. Yes. Because they're no longer eligible for the extra pay. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Council member Rollo. Um, <clears throat> anticipating uh, contract negotiations in 2022, uh, what, do you anticipate would be the effective date of the uh, conclusions of those discussions? Was would it be when? What when would it affect salaries, Mr. Underwood? One one twenty three. The contract runs through the end okay. of twenty twenty three. One one twenty three. Okay. Yes. Very good. And it would be then it would be dependent on the number of years that was negotiated. Uh, typically, they're four-year contracts. We've seen three. We've seen five. Okay. Okay. Um, so you anticipate the negotiations being concluded by the end of the year and it being reflected in the budget for 2023? Yeah. The idea is to start them early, uh, approximately yeah. three months earlier than we would have them concluded prior to the construction of the budget. So we would have some idea of what additional revenues that we would need that way the administration can work with the council on finding those additional revenues necessary to fund both uh, a new contract and adjustments to uh, supervisory pay so that we can have those already scheduled for in the budget that we present in August that would go into effect January 1st, 2023. So optimally, you would be able to conclude the negotiations by next May? Uh, no later than the end of June, but I pr would prefer the end of May. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Additional questions? Council Member Smith. Thank you. <clears throat> I think this is another question for Mr. Underwood. So sorry, Mr. Underwood. Um, when, we found, when we find these additional funds for um, market adjustment and, and the one-time uh, retention payments, where, where do those funds come from? Um, will you walk me through that a little bit? Sure. For uh, 2021, I uh, believe we'll have enough savings in the category one of the police, current police budget to uh, make those payments, both for the supervisory and sworn officers. For 2022, uh, we've added an additional $400,000 in ARPA funding uh, to go with money that was already in there uh, to fund that. Great, thank you. That was helpful, thanks. Thank you. Additional round one questions. If not, I have one. Okay. Seeing none, um, just to confirm my understanding, um, the $5,000 over five quarters that is anticipated for our sworn officers, that's not part of base pay. It doesn't change their base pay, correct? Nor does it change, and there's a question mark at the end of this, future raises are not based on their current salary plus 5,000 either. Is that correct? That, uh, that'll be a, a part, technically yes, uh, but that will be a matter of negotiation um, that we're planning to start. Okay. and. You've mentioned that the start date for any new contract is January 1, 23. Um, what would it take to move up that date? What would it take if we wanted to begin a contract sooner? Is that even possible? You can reopen the contract uh, for specific reasons. Uh, we've elected not to do that, um, that but however, that, that would be under consideration. Okay, so every, so all of the, 
all of the changes we're discussing now leave the current contract intact for sworn officers, add the additional pay of 5,000 over five quarters, and then you, you mentioned reopening the negotiations. Has the administration begun that process yet, or we do not intend? We do not intend to at this point to reopen the. Current I'm sorry. I mean, uh, ne uh, to move up the schedule for negotiations. Yes, for we have already put that in the works, and we have uh, sessions already scheduled uh, with the union beginning in October. Good. Okay. Thank you. Additional round one questions from anyone? Okay. Seeing none, are there any co comments from council members? Council member Sandberg. Thank you. I appreciate any and all adjustments that are made because of course that was in our resolution uh, with respect to the leadership positions, making sure that those were competitive, as competitive as we can make them in the here and now and retroactive. That was, that was a part of what we uh, had recommended. So grateful for that, thankful for that. I'm sure the officers will appreciate any and all assistance here. Uh, as I will discuss in the later budget with respect to the police salaries, I do have concerns with the um, incremental one time, well, you know, five times, <laughs> a thousand, as they are bonuses and not raises to the base pay. Uh, and so while, once again, I'm sure the officers will be glad to have it, I don't think it addresses the uh, incremental problem. And the most uh, significant problem that I see is with retention. We kind of lump recruiting and retention all in the same breath, but actually right now with the current issues that are going on with the police department that the public ought to be concerned about, I certainly am, have to do with whatever we can do to retain the good officers that we already have. And so. Um, uh, I will be anticipating and hoping that during the collective bargaining session, uh, significant progress can be made on that, the base pay. And I do want to make it clear as well that pay alone is not the only problem that is causing our officers to leave the ranks. And so there are a lot of strategies that we're going to need to um, look at between now and, well, as soon as we possibly can to um, stop the loss of our police officers that are causing the staffing shortfalls that again, uh, should be of concern to anybody with regard to public safety. So again, thankful for whatever can be done, but uh, there's a lot more we can do. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Rollo. Thank you. Um, I uh, like Council Member Sandberg, uh, I intend to support this, um, but I find it uh, inadequate for the reasons that she stated, and I'll just restate them, that um, as it is a one-time bonus, it may have some uh, interim effect on recruitment, but what is, what is really required is a base salary increase for uh, retention because it doesn't really uh, address retention. Um, if we're going to be competitive uh, with other jurisdictions around the state, uh, we have to be competitive in our base salary pay. And um, this is just a temporary measure. So it, it's not adequate. Um, and I, uh, the, the current staffing levels give me um, much concern. Um, I'm very, very concerned about inadequate staffing levels uh, currently. Um, so that said, um, I do appreciate the uh, address addressing of the uh, wage compression for supervisors. Uh, that is a good step forward. And I hope that given negotiations coming, that we make significant steps toward addressing retention which will require a base salary increase. I don't see, I don't see how it's possible otherwise. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments, or is there a motion? Do I hear a move to pass? Move to pass. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to go left to right on my screen. Council Member Sandberg? Yes. Council Member Sims? 
Council Member Sims. I'm sorry. Yes. Thanks. Council Member Smith. Yes. Rollo. Yes. Piedmont Smith. Yes. Bolin. Yes. Rosenberger. Yes. Flaherty. Yes. And Scambolari, yes. So that is nine zero zero. Thank you, everyone. Moving on to our second piece of legislation, uh, Ordinance 21-36, an ordinance fixing the salaries of officers of police and fire departments for the city of Bloomington, Indiana for the year 2022. And Ms. Shaw, I believe you are with us again. Yes, thank you. Ordinance 2136 outlines the salaries for officers of the police and fire departments. The ordinance also includes unit compensation for longevity, education, certification, training, and other qualifications defined by and provided by the respective collective bargaining agreements. In fire, salaries for fire captains, chauffeur, and first class fire officers are listed according to the current salaries outlined in the contract between the City of Bloomington and Bloomington Metropolitan Fire Fighters Local 586 and represent a 2% increase in 2022. Other fire personnel will receive a 2.75% increase. Additionally, an Assistant Deputy Chief of Administration and Planning, Grade 9, is a new position which will provide additional administrative and planning support as recommended in the department's organizational assessment. The fiscal impact of this new position is around almost $100,000. And in police salaries for officer first class, senior police officers are set in accordance with the negotiations in the city and the Fraternal Order of Police Lodge 88 and represent a 2.9% increase in 2022. The other police personnel will receive a 2.75 pay increase to their 2021 salaries. The pay grades for lieutenants went from an eight to a nine, just like we talked in the last amendment, and the pay grades for captains increased from a nine to 10. Offers of the non-contractual salaries who were previously eligible for extra pay above their base pay will not receive pay, will receive pay increases and no longer be eligible for extra pay. Supervisory sergeants, officers, first class and senior police officers will receive an additional $1,000 each quarter in retention pay. A regular full-time officers of both police and fire will also receive a COVID recognition payment in the amount of $500. This is consistent with all, all city employees. Your approval of this ordinance is requested. And I'm happy to take any questions at this time. Thank you, Ms. Shaw. Questions from council? Seeing none. Let's go to public comment then. Um, again, by way of reminder, if you would like to offer public comment, please use the raise hand function in Zoom that is generally located under participants or under the more button. Um, if those don't work, you can send a message in chat to our meeting host, Stephen Lucas. Um, if there is more than one individual on a given device, please let us know that ahead of time so we can ensure that everyone gets their allotted time for comment. So, Mr. Lucas, did that was that everything? Usually, I miss something from that list of instructions. I believe so. Um, I, I think you mentioned earlier in the meeting that each uh, speaker would have three minutes per yes. comment, and Thank I you. see one speaker uh, at the moment, uh, Colin Murphy, who should now be able to unmute. Mr. Murphy, welcome. You'll have three minutes. Please go ahead. Thank you. Can you hear me clearly? First of all. Yes, thank you. Wonderful. My name, hello, uh, good evening, council members and uh, members of the public. My name is Colin Murphy and I sit on the Bloomington Commission on Sustainability. I'm here with a couple of colleagues tonight to read a resolution to you on housing. So this resolution declares housing stability as a human right and calls for a sustainably designed citywide comprehensive housing first program to end housing instability. Whereas the City of Bloomington Commission on Sustainability, or BCOS, promotes economic development, environmental health, and social equity in our community for present and future generations, noting the unsustainable nature Murphy, of the negative- just, Mr. Murphy, just to clarify, we are accepting public comment on Ordinance 2136. Will the resolution that you speak of speak to this ordinance in particular? 
Uh, it speaks to where we feel that the council should prioritize funding the budget. So yes. Okay, go ahead. May, may I have some time back or should I, um, I'll just continue. Yes. I'll just continue. So whereas the, noting the unsustainable nature of the negative socioeconomic externality, where the main beneficiaries of Bloomington's rising costs of housing are the biggest owners of real estate, while unhoused non-property owning residents pay the largest cost with their dignity, health, and safety, alarmed by reports of exclusion of city residents from available housing services due to behaviors associated with disabilities, as well as the high likelihood of unhoused people to have one or more disabilities, while reaffirming our municipal code on non-discrimination and the provision of housing services due to disability status, emphasizing that housing first approaches that include a permanent supportive housing program that provides housing stability to all unhoused citizens may save cities as much as $23,000 per successful program participant through the cost savings from emergency services, welcoming the city of Bloomington's efforts to minimize the size of the unhoused population by increasing the supply of affordable housing, while acknowledging that these efforts should not be expected to meet the housing needs of every resident of our city, affirming the human solidarity and goodwill shown by local private, nonprofit, and religious organizations to help house residents through existing housing programs, while recognizing that in spite of decades of these efforts, our city continues to have residents who lack housing stability, including many who are reportedly disabled, declaring that the mental trauma, physical challenges, and continual health and safety risks ex experienced by residents who lack stable housing is at odds with the social equity, environmental health, and economic development of our entire community. And lastly, believing that a comprehensive housing first policy approach has proven to be an economically sensible environmentally sustainable and socially equitable policy solution to ending housing instability in other US cities. And I will see time for my uh, colleague to complete later. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Mr. Lucas, who do we have next? Next is Jarrett Alexander. Mr. Alexander, welcome. You have three minutes. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm gonna continue reading the this resolution that my colleague, Mr. Murphy, uh, started, and then I'll pass over to our other colleague, Najla, to, uh, to uh, comment on how this is relevant to this discussion. So, therefore, be it resolved that the Commission on Sustainability urges the Bloomington City Council, working in collaboration with the Mayor of Bloomington, to adopt housing stability as a right in its municipal code, urges the Mayor of Bloomington, working in collaboration with the Bloomington Common Council, to conduct a feasibility study and subsequently develop a housing first plan by December 25th, 2021 to ensure housing stability to all residents. Further urges the mayor of Bloomington working in collaboration with the Bloomington Common Council to work with all stakeholders to identify and address existing gaps and barriers to achieving housing stability for all residents. And lastly, to support the long-term success of the Housing First program, urges the mayor of Bloomington working in collaboration with the Bloomington Common Council to identify and consider all public and private sources of funds, especially any major contributing agents to and or beneficiaries of the rising housing costs in our city. Uh, so this was passed by our commission on February 9th, 2021 with seven yes votes and zero no votes. Um, and now I will pass it over to my colleague, Najla, who will make the comments relating to this resolution. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I believe it's, it's Ms. Routsong. Am I saying that correctly? Yes, you are. Thank you. Okay, you'll have three minutes. Please go ahead and again, please tie this very directly to Ordinance 2136. My name is Najla Routsong and I also sit on BCAUSE. As a scholar of international law, I believe that this city's practice of leaving many of our most marginalized community members to struggle for their survival in the outdoors is a violation of human rights. Furthermore, forcing unhoused people to disperse from camping on public property without providing them with safe alternative shelter violates several international treaties the US has signed. Under these treaties, all people have a right, right to housing and all governments have an obligation to put the well being of people above concerns about disorder. In addition, this practice is incompatible with our city's long-term economic and environmental securities. For all of these reasons, I authored the resolution on housing first, which passed unanimously on BCAUSE. This resolution calls for the mayor's office and common council to take several actions, including declaring housing as a human right and to take 
all actions necessary to ensure safe and supportive housing is made available to every citizen by December of this year. When Mayor Hamilton introduced his budgetary recommendations in his public remarks to this council several weeks ago, he noted that public safety is the most basic function of any government. While providing safety from violent crime is one of the most fundamental roles of any government, research shows that increasing police funds has not been shown to reduce violence or even to solve more crimes. In fact, the most effective and lasting way to address violent crime is to address the root causes, including poverty, trauma, homelessness, addiction, and lack of adequate health care. Today, we are here from Because to remind the council that this city's most fundamental responsibility to its citizens is not to increase already police, already bloated police budgets, but to ensure the basic human survival needs of our citizens are met. Um, for too long, our city has shifted responsibility of housing our most vulnerable citizens onto the charity and goodwill efforts of volunteers, religious and nonprofit organizations. This strategy has resulted in the unnecessary and early deaths of far too many of our city's residents. No one in Bloomington should ever pay for our city's economic growth with their lives. As climate change continues to make our summers hotter, our co winters colder, we, our city must act decisively to prioritize care over control and to choose consent and dignity over coercion and violence. Increasing the police budget without a plan to comprehensively address the homelessness crisis exploding around us is unconscionably irresponsible and unjust because it causes the most harm to the most vulnerable members of our community. I urge all city council members to heed the call for action made by our resolution by voting against the city's proposed 2022 budget for its failure to address its most fundamental role as a governmental body which is in fact to ensure the basic resources required for human survival are provided to all of us, including and especially our most marginalized citizens. Instead, this budget as written would support the expansion of current police practices, which violate their human rights as defined in multiple international treaties. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Atsong. Are there additional commenters, Mr. Lucas? I don't see any additional comments at the moment. Oh, yes, I do see one from Cody F. Welcome, if you would, please state your full name for the record and then you'll have three minutes. Yes, my name is Cody Forston. I'm a sergeant with the Bloomington Police Department. Um, I, I just basically was curious if there could be some, um, some clarification. When Ms. Shaw was reading the ordinance about the salaries it, it sounded as if the supervisory sergeants would also not get any of the what's considered extra pay for the specialties and so forth um i just wasn't sure if that was the case or not um i just kind of wanted to comment that there are a lot of sergeants that do a lot of the extra details um the special assignments that if that was cut out for them they would basically lose any of the amount of pay that they would make over and above a senior police officer <coughs> excuse me any, any additional pay that they would make over above over and above a senior police officer would be lost I uh, just wondered if somebody could clarify. Does that conclude your comments, Mr. Forster? Sounds like it. Um, we, this is not a point to engage in dialogue, but one of our council members very well may take up that question. So thank you for the comment. Additional public comment, Mr. Lucas? Yes, I do see uh, a message from Sam Dove uh, that he is, I think, working on now to send to me to read. Um, I'm happy to uh, to read that once it comes in, if you'd like. Um, uh, aside from that, I don't see any additional requests for comments. Okay. And just by way of reminder, if you would like to offer public comment, please use the raise hand function in Zoom uh, or type a message into chat or press star nine on your cell phone. If there's more than one person on a single device, please let us know that so we can ensure everyone gets their allotted time. So, and Mr. Lucas, do we have Mr. Dove's message yet? 
not quite yet. I'm happy to pass that along to council members uh, if you'd like to, to move on, um, or I can uh, read that once it once it comes in. Okay. Why don't we go ahead and, I, and then? I, I just just received it. Uh, oh, Mr. Right. Dev um, states that uh, folks who are homeless can't leave trash in the park. It's not okay with the city legal department. And I think that's the end of the comment. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dove. Anyone else, Mr. Lucas? Okay. With that, let's come back to council for questions. Council Member Sandberg. Well, I don't know if anybody wants to address uh, Cody F's uh, concern. It sounds like we did not adequately address that, at least with respect to people in the department who are inquiring about the sergeants. Uh, so if anybody can pick that question up, that would be helpful. I would be all. happy to. Oh, I would be you, happy Jeff. to do that. <laughs> Jeff Underwood, city controller. Uh, yes, they will continue to re receive those pays. Just as they do now. All right, so that is some assurance then to anyone in the sergeant category and, and below lieutenants and captains. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yes, and I take full responsibility if I misspoke and misled the supervisory sergeant. So thank you for that question and thank you for clarifying. Uh, and I'll make sure that um, the legislation also reflects that. All right, thank you. Thank you. Additional questions? Seeing none, let's move into council comment. Council Member Sandberg. Well, once again, as we are dealing with the issues surrounding the Bloomington Police Department, uh, salary is a, a part of this. And with respect to the other comments um, that, that, that seem to imply that we need to diminish our support for the police department, um, I, I will acknowledge that the city is a complicated machine and there are all kinds of needs that this budget needs to address, not the least of which housing concerns, uh, dealing with individuals in the community as has been described, who are um, displaced and on the margins. And with respect to, again to the police department, um, in, in talking with our police who are tasked with a number of enforcement issues throughout the city, I think they will also acknowledge that the police are here to serve those individuals as well. Um, and so I wanna make it clear that in our support for increasing the resources that it's going to take to maintain the quality of our police department, that we are not at odds with anyone else who may be coming into this, um, this particular discussion, uh, suggesting that we cut the police budget and place it elsewhere. Um, we once again are grateful for the ARPA funding that is um, allowing us to give one-time bonuses um, to try to help bridge some of the gaps that we are desperately trying to make up for. Um, we cannot keep public safety at the forefront of this community if we don't operate on all of the burners. And that means respect for, support for, and adequate pay compensation for those who are doing their level best under very unfortunate circumstances, difficult circumstances, and with staffing shortages to be the kind of police that are proactive, that are doing community work, that are here to serve and protect everyone in the city. And so I wanna make that clear that in our appeal to increase the police budget, make sure we are competitive with, our, with respect to our, with our retention. And again, retention is my number one concern with this budget. Uh, we have a long way to go on this front, as well as many others as we will hear throughout this budget. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comment, Council Member Volan. Yes, thank you. Um, it's an interesting commentary uh, to receive uh, on this ordinance uh, and one that I understand where it's coming from. Uh, it, and it's a difficult subject to raise under any circumstances. Um, the, my first thought when hearing it was uh, part of the, I mean, I've always tried to distinguish 
operating expenses from capital expenses. As important as housing first is, it's fundamental as an expense, it's fundamentally a capital expense. We're trying to uh, identify permanent fixtures that you pay for one time, maintain over time. The maintenance is an operating cost, but the construction of them is the kind of thing that like anything else we do in the city would be something that we would likely to bond for. So uh, tying it to an ordinance that's about operating expenses, uh, not entirely convincing to me, but more significantly, um, if we're going to have a police department at all, if we're going to have operating expenses, uh, it doesn't make sense to, uh, uh, to, to not fund the mandate. Um, and so uh, what uh, the administration is proposing, however, uh, um, impermanently, is a kind of raising of the debt ceiling. So, uh, you know, I, one of the most significant reasons that I, I've, I've been reading some of the uh, uh, exit surveys by officers who've left the department, uh, which is as clear a, uh, an expression of their concern as, as any we could hope to see. And one of the biggest reasons that officers who left the department said they were leaving was that uh, they too found it difficult to come in every day and find themselves tied up with dealing with the, the um, uh, with what they said was the homeless population. And uh, while we can workshop the exact terms we use around it, uh, they're not any more thrilled to have to uh, be assigned this task as anyone. Um, so, you know, I sympathize with the idea that housing first is housing is it should be a human right and we should be moving towards it. Um, at, at this minute with this ordinance, it's it's I don't think it's the right time. It's a little too late. We need to that that's a big uh, thing that we should be doing. And while I question some of the other administration's uh, uh, priorities, in this case, uh, you know, I just don't think it's appropriate not to pass this particular ordinance. Um, well, we already know that, it, uh, in fact, uh, uh, for the service we're providing, uh, it, 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 we, we don't fund it adequately. So uh, I, I'm going to support this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Rollo. As I indicated before, I will support the ordinance as amended, um, but to bring to uh, a bearing on the attrition problem, uh, this is a crisis that we need to attend to, and um, this falls short. We, we, we need a base salary increase. Um, uh, an, an officer, uh, I understand, uh, left yesterday, um, left the force, and others leaving on Sunday. Um, the council uh, approved annexation, which will require dozens more. Um, yesterday, there was a shooting on the east side, uh, and we had six officers on duty when we had formerly had 10 officers on duty. Um, if we had another incident like that, it, it couldn't have, it, it would have really strained uh, the, the force. Um, there is no opportunity for proactive policing, which is really an essential part, I think, of dealing with uh, homeless people, people who have uh, addiction, mental health, health problems, and, ju and just in order to um, uh, relate and to, to uh, have interactions with neighborhoods and, and the community. You can't have that when you have a police force that is so uh, strained. So um, I'll support this as amended, but again, call for an increase in salaries um, for the best uh, police force, one that has, we have an adequate number that can do the types of uh, community policing that we expect uh, to, to, to have and uh, gives us optimal uh, security that we know that you know, we, we aren't going to have uh, overworked, undervalued, 
officers who are uh, like any human being uh, when you're stressed. Uh, mistakes could happen, and, and we don't want that uh, situation to occur. No one does. Um, so um, there's much more work to do, but I'll support this uh, for, the, uh, for the time being. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member Allen. Additional comments? Council Member Flaherty. Thank you. Um, I did want to briefly address uh, or address the collective comment from, from Mr. Murphy and Mr. Alexander and Ms. Ritsong with regard to city budget priorities vis-a-vis -vis police budgets in particular, um, as well as the resolution that was passed by uh, the Bloomington Commission on Sustainability earlier this year. I had uh, mentioned that resolution to the council um, in the past at probably a meeting in May or June, um, which was a resolution I voted for, along with all BCOS members who were in attendance. Um, and first, I just wanted to note that I, I do think we are making some progress with regard to the priorities and requests of that resolution. Uh, and uh, I think some of that's reflected in the budget and maybe discussed later tonight with regard to housing and security and some other things. Um, but I also think more can be done. And I think the broader point um, that they were making is that the safety and security of our residents safety and security are both fundamental governmental functions and that these obligations apply to all residents regardless of housing status or other conditions for which they may be marginalized. So we've had, of course, some very lengthy council member and community conversations around this, um, including earlier this year. And I think we found there were some differing opinions, frankly. Um, I remember a, a sort of stunning moment to me in a conversation with the former deputy mayor about the responsibility of government as a, a provider of last resorts uh, for unhoused residents whom society has failed. So there's differing levels of um, understanding or values, I think, on, about whose responsibility it is to um, address our most vulnerable residents and help them. Uh, uh, I additionally think that the BCOS members were suggesting or submitting that a police force is not the best or the most appropriate avenue to be trying to address a number of different communal challenges, uh, perhaps uh, mental health crises, but certainly including uh, homelessness as well, which sometimes have overlap. So that's a sentiment I share, um, as do I think most progressive thinkers on public safety and homelessness issues. Um, my, my colleague just mentioned some some things with regard to proactive policing, but go to go to the go to the Bloomington Homeless Coalition. Talks to talk to folks experiencing homelessness or even homelessness service providers. Do they think that proactive policing is the tool we should be using? to address homelessness. I, I think that's uh, very out of step with what people who are actually marginalized and in this position, the people with lived experience would tell you. Um, and I say that because they've told me, um, at least in some instances. So I think the overall point being made here is that budgets inevitably involve trade-offs, as the mayor noted earlier tonight, and that our city budget is in fact a zero-sum game. Uh, and that, you know, a crisis is in the eye of the beholder. So a police retention crisis versus a homelessness crisis versus a climate crisis and how we address those things. Um, and I think, again, part of the point is that you can address police retention issues, uh, not necessarily only by paying them more, but also by reducing their workload, by taking things off their plate that they are uh, perhaps struggling to deal with. Uh, Councilmember Volan just mentioned uh, that that a number of the exit interviews, which I haven't had a chance to review yet, but I look forward to doing, uh, mentioned uh, a sort of frustration with with dealing with this societal problem on their own. So again, I think we have not done an adequate job as a city exploring non-police alternatives in dealing with a variety of societal challenges that are not naturally uh, or perhaps uh, not ideally uh, things that the police would be handling. So I think that's the broader point. And I just wanted to note that I, I very much share their opinion on that. And I think we need to continue to make progress um, on those fronts. So I just did want to address that. And I appreciate the members um, sharing that resolution and, and talking about some of the trade-offs and priorities that are involved when we um, you know, add 16 new positions in public safety, for instance, or, or uh, commit to, to spending of ARPA funds in a certain way. Um, so I think just adding more pay all the time uh, is not necessarily the only tool to address uh, some of the things that are actually affecting retention per, per the surveys we've seen. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments? Council Member Sims. Thank you very much. Um, and first of all, I want to um, thank BCOS members, um, Ralph Song, if I pronounced that correctly, Alexander and Murphy for their comments. 
Um, I think that really goes to show um, that not only dealing with this budget, but we as a community have many, many um, situations that we need to work toward and hopefully improve and ultimately make some very hard decisions with regard to um, prioritizing revenues um, and how we use them. Um, and that's a, a, a future conversation. Um, I do agree with some of the things that I've just heard, um, and particularly with um, sworn officers, uh, the need to reduce their workload. Um, I will say this, um, part of this budget will increase our non-sworn officers. Um, and I think we, uh, BPD and their staff is working toward how best to utilize those group of community um, service folks and our social workers. Um, and I think we're working toward where we can reduce um, some of the, the duties in the workload of our sworn officers. Um, but it's still a while down the road. We have to figure out some things. Um, there is some, some issues with actually policing and what you could get into with non-sworn officers. Um, but I, I, I'm confident that we can work toward that. Now back to really this ordinance. Um, I too agree, I, I think um, what, what the resolution addressed, um, and those who don't know is the resolution with the base salary, what it was to address, I think, I don't think what the mayor's proposing is quite enough um, as we move forward. When we first started this conversation, there was a, a lack of a better term and not to um, uh, make the wrong assumption, but there was zero versus $5,000. And that left room for some compromise, some, some discussions. What the administration came back was instead of the $5,000 base pay was a $5,000 bonus plan or quarterly bonus over 15 months. That represents to me, even though I said it's inadequate, that does represent to me some collaboration, some seeking of common ground. So I think I myself, along with many of my other colleagues, will be interesting in watching uh, the contract negotiations to see where we end up when down the line. Um, lastly, I want to say that there is a distinct difference between recruitment and retention. Um, recruitment is, is challenging. There are some problems across this country, and we are not the only police department that is suffering those challenges and those issues. Um, there's some societal um, issues that we need to deal with. Many folks don't want to be in law enforcement anymore. Um, so that's part of the, the issue there. That's a little bit more out of our control and something we can work toward to and plan to. I submit that retaining our officers is directly in our control. Um, and I think it's important that we maintain those that we have um, in order to support our non-sworn officers and vice versa, so that we can ultimately reduce the workload of our sworn officers. And hopefully we can get to a position where our officers, our sworn officers feel like they're supported by this community, where we can have some improved morale within the department. Um, there's other issues such as upward mobility, um, some other issues that we'll address moving down the line. Um, but first and foremost, I think public safety is one of the, the tenets of, of being in a, in a society. And um, I'm looking forward to future conversations and I will support uh, this particular ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments from council members. Council member Piedmont Smith. Yes, um, I'm gonna pass on this. Uh... Uh, ordinance this evening, I I feel like um, there's still a, a possibility that the current police contract can be reopened and uh, renegotiated to uh, with the aim of um, increasing base pay of our police officers. Um, I think that we do have we don't have enough police officers. Uh, we have police officers leaving every week um, and we don't 
have enough and it's it's a big problem. And so I, I really don't want to move this forward with my approval until we've we've tried all avenues and to see if the current uh, contract can be reopened. Um, I think there's some confusion as to the meetings that have been scheduled for October, whether it's a reopening of the current contract or an early start on the next contract. Um, so, uh, so that's that. And I, I did want to um, touch upon uh, and express my appreciation for the BCOS resolution on uh, housing as a human right. Um, and I, I do feel strongly that we, we need to do all we can to address the root causes of homelessness. This is a, a community-wide issue um, that uh, we need to work together with with um, colleagues in other branches of local government, with social service agencies and, and others on. Um, but certainly the city does have some responsibility. And I, I continue to, uh, to uh, despair that we basically do um, make it illegal for, for people without homes, uh, people experiencing homelessness to sleep in public. And that is a continuing concern of mine. And I, I think that's, that's just fundamentally wrong. Um, so I, we definitely have things to work on. But I, I also think you know, policing is something that uh, we, need to, we need to consider whether it's the best answer to a lot of situations. Um, but I think there is a minimum baseline of how many uh, police or community our size need. Um, and uh, it's especially distressing to, to learn that some of the training that is so uh, has, has, has been followed so well in our community has uh, fallen a bit by the wayside because of the, the pressures on the few fewer officers who remain uh, on staff. So, so anyway, I, I will um, uh, be passing on this particular ordinance and, and hope to get more clarity before the final budget vote. Thank you. Thank you. Additional first round question. First, excuse me, first round comment. Council Member Smith. Thank you. Um, in in, uh, in thinking about uh, the officer's compensation and um, trying to determine why uh, there's uh, people leaving at a high rate, why we're at minimum staffing, why our retention seems to be uh, decreasing. I think it, you know, I, I'm going to support this, uh, but uh, it, it, I think one of the things that came out of this whole discussion over the last few weeks is why wasn't this being addressed? Why, I mean, I mean, why wasn't the administration uh, looking at this specifically and approaching some kind of resolution with it when things were really starting to go sideways here? Um, when we asked them about whether there was an exit survey, the answer was no. Um, I, I found that incredulous that um, a big part of the budget with a lot of uh, important functions, such as the police department, um, they weren't, it wasn't being looked at uh, and analyzed in, a, in an aggregate way over the course you know, five years, why are people leaving? I, I, I just can't understand why that wasn't happening. So when myself and, and uh, Council Member Rallo and Sandberg sponsored that resolution and a lot of you joined us, I, I hope that one of the things that comes out of this is that we brought this to a, 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 a you know, higher profile so that people can look at it and say, well, maybe we're going to analyze the reasons why this is happening. Um, in the survey information we recently received, salary certainly is a, a big component of it. The other component that seems to be prevalent, and it's a small sample, uh, is that uh, the BPD officers rank and file, they don't feel supported by the administration. So for, you know, for whatever, however important that is, that, that just lends, that tells me that some other things do need to go on as some of you have referenced um, besides salary. So um, I'm thankful for the movement we've had. Um, I'm gonna support this, but 
uh, as some of my colleagues have said, there's 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 definitely more work to be done, and and uh, I'm happy to be as helpful as I can, um, you know, doing that and bringing bringing it forward. So thank you very much. Thank you. Additional round one comments. If not, I may offer some thoughts. Okay. Um, see, now I appreciate what the mayor has done with the thousand dollars per quarter for five quarters. Um, it's a beginning, but it's just a beginning. It does not solve the long-term systemic issue um, that we have with with recruitment and especially retention. And I appreciate Council Member Sims putting a finer point on the distinction between those two issues. Um, I also, while I appreciate the comments offered by BCOS, I've always been troubled by the argument that attending to issues of public safety and investing in public safety and responding to issues of housing and security are mutually exclusive. We can't possibly do both. Um, I think we can. And I think that council has made some decisions in that regard. We are looking at expenditures in ARPA that are really significant, particularly in the arena of housing and security. Um, I think we still need to ask difficult questions about the kinds of resources we need in law enforcement. Um, I think I look forward to seeing us expand the number of social workers we have, the number of community resource officers we have. Um, to reduce that particular kind of burden on our sworn officers. Um, but I do feel we can address both of those issues. I don't feel those are mutually exclusive. Um, I think we also cannot lose sight of the fact that retention issues are expensive. Any amount of money we have to spend to find new officers and train new officers when we have lost experienced ones, are re those are resources we can't spend on something else. So I don't think that we can overlook the sheer expense of retention. Um, I, again, I appreciate what the mayor has done with the $5,000 bump, um, but I think several members of this council have conveyed, we're watching closely. Um, I look forward to additional clarification on, if I understood correctly, Mr. Underwood said that we are not reopening the current contract but we're beginning the 2023 negotiations early. If, if I understood correctly, that's where we are. Um, I think you have a lot of avid viewers on this council who are gonna be watching that um, and who are gonna push hard on these issues of salary and who are gonna to continue to ask tough questions about how our public safety function is organized and the different kinds of tools we have in that toolkit. Um, again, uh, I think I may abstain on this particular one for right now, but we'll see. Okay. On to round two. Are there round two comments? Council members Sandberg, then Rollo. Thank you. And once again, I want to make it clear that we do not expect the police to be social workers. We do not expect them to do the job that belong to other professionals in the mental health profession, in the addiction profession in all of our various professions that are well better equipped to deal with those kinds of things. I wanna make it clear that I do support Chief Decoff's initiatives to join 21st century policing policies, his incredible work toward adding DROs and adding social workers and, and adding community specialists. That is to be commended. That puts us light years ahead of many communities throughout the state and throughout the country. So cheers to that. But one thing I wanna make clear is our current social work team and their resource community specialists are only able to respond to 5% of the calls because their work and the work of the police are also completely different. And I do not want, and nor do the police want to be the ones responsible for dealing with the mental illness issues that are, that are absolutely exploding around us and the issues pertaining to um, uh, the unhoused. That is not the role of the police. And I think we need to respect that. Um, I have read those exit surveys and they are sobering, absolutely sobering. And this was done by the police themselves. And again, many of my colleagues have voiced 
why hasn't, you know, why have not exit surveys been done before to try to help us get a handle on why are our officers leaving us? Well, the people who responded to that exit survey, as you might imagine, they're telling it like it is. They're not candy coating their reasons for leaving and why they would not recommend to anybody else to want to come here to work, why they are frustrated, why they were burnt out, and why they sought other options for themselves. And I think this is critical for us as we're looking at other community ills and other things that our budgets need to try to handle. We need to respect that these police officers are human beings too. They have lives, they have families, they have their own mental health that they need to look toward. And those exit surveys, I'm grateful that we got them. And thank you to Paul Post for taking the time to get that information to us. If you haven't read them, the administration needs to read them. We all need to read them. And I know the public should have some concerns about why our officers are leaving us, because that's the only way we're going to get to the solutions. I've also made it clear that it is not just money that's going to stem the tide. We have to support the whole idea of enforcement of our laws, protections of our properties, protections for our safety when there's gunfire in our city, when there are knife fights in our city, when there are all kinds of things that the police actually are trained to respond to. That yes, I absolutely agree with my colleagues they should not be responding to issues that professional mental health officers, professional mental health people and social workers should be the ones responding to. And again, shoulda, woulda, coulda, we don't have control over our behavioral health centers. We don't have control over our nonprofits. We can only manage the affairs of our basic city services, which involve police, fire, infrastructure, sanitation, all of that, basic city services. That is our purview. That's why I'm so strongly in support of doing everything we can to support the Bloomington Police Department. We've neglected it for too long. We're seeing the results. It's bad and it's gonna take years to course correct. And um, that's, that's a pretty dire warning, but I too am gonna pass on this budget because as much as it's incrementally better, it's not there yet. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Rollo. Thank you. Um, I've been convinced now uh, because of the arguments of uh, Council Member Piedmont Smith and others that um, I, I will pass tonight on this. Um, I think uh, Council Member Scamalura, you put it right that this is, um, seems like it's incrementalism uh, when the nature of the problem, the current problem is, is really one of a crisis. And um, I don't think that's hyperbole because we have an objective study called by the consultancy group, uh, the Novak report, which indicates that we should really be much closer to 121 officers, sworn officers in the city. And uh, as of today or by someday, we should be in the high 80s. So um, we have many fewer officers than we need. And it does recommend some 30% of officer time devoted to proactive policing. And um, I, I guess I differ with my colleague, um, Council Member Flaherty, that I think proactive policing is fundamental for our community, um, for our residents uh, with police, because it, is, it reduces, hopefully uh, eliminates the perception uh, of off, that officers present a threat. And uh, that certainly applies uh, to homeless residents of the city. Um, so um, by all measures, I think that um, the base pay should increase by $5,000. Um, that should be seen as a minimum. Um, that brings us closer, but in no way really uh, brings us into, in, into really uh, a competitive arena with other jurisdictions throughout the state. It just, it, it brings us closer, but it doesn't, it doesn't really ameliorate the problem. So um, as Council Member Sandberg said it wisely a moment ago, that this is a problem that's uh, accumulated for some time. And I think it's gonna take us a while to get out of it, um, but we should begin with this budget. So I'll, I'll be passing on this tonight to, to reconsider it a bit longer. 
Thanks. Thank you. Additional comments? Council Member Volan. Yeah, I find this debate very interesting and I appreciate it. Um, the objection I tried to delineate in my previous comment is in pitting one group of concerns with an, against another group of concerns. While the budget is a zero sum game, actually, I don't think that, I, I disagree with that characterization, frankly. Um, uh, there are certainly trade-offs we have to make, but uh, how we use our money can have a multiplying effects. Uh, we're certainly doing that with some of the CARES Act money. Um, but, uh, I, you know, one thing that, one thought that went through my head uh, is that I'm somebody who is accustomed to representing a great number of constituents who don't advocate for themselves. Uh, we're used to thinking of them as students, but the point is that uh, students are, are rarely ones who advocate for themselves. And as important as the concerns of the police rank and file are, they at least have representation. They have a union, they have members who, uh, who come and speak for their position and who have finally persuaded the council that more needs to be done. Um, I don't want to, uh, you know, without uh, changing anything I said about my support for uh, a better paid force, uh, one that also might be relieved of some duties that, uh, uh, that they shouldn't have to be doing or that can be done in other ways, by far the best way that they can be relieved of duties is if this city has a capital plan for providing some kind of housing greater than shelter housing, which is not really housing. It's, it's an a emergency shelter. It's, it, you know, it's not permanent housing. Um, and the, the, the people who spoke in public comment are correct that we need to address as a city this crisis in housing. Uh, and I, I, I agree with whoever it was who said that they're not mutually exclusive uh, issues. But what we don't have yet is a clear commitment. If it's not even something that's been discussed as a result of this uh, budget process for 2022, and yet it needs to be. It's uh, the, the Commission on Sustainability doesn't just focus on the environment. They also focus on uh, ec economic uh, sustainability and social sustainability, and this is the latter. Um, so it disappoints me that we don't have a capital plan that would address housing first, uh, and it's time we did. So, um, you know, I just don't want my concerns over the police to be seen or, you know, to, to even have to think about my concerns as being... Uh, the other side of the coin of the housing and homeless crisis, it shouldn't be. And uh, I reject that, that, uh, that equation. Thank you. Thank you. Additional round two comments. Seeing none, are there any round three comments? And seeing none, is there a motion? Move to pass. Thank you. And a second? Second. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to go across my screen here. Council Member Rallo? Pass. Council Member Volan? Pass. Council Member Rosenbarger? Yes. Council Member Sims? Yes. Council Member Flaherty? Yes. Council Member Piedmont Smith? Pass. Council Member Smith? Yes. And Council Member Sandberg? Pass. And Council Member Scambaluri? Pass. That is 405. Is that correct? Yes. 
Thank you, everyone. Uh, moving on to Ordinance 2137, an ordinance fixing the salaries of appointed officers, non-union, and AFSCME employees for all departments of the city of Bloomington, Monroe County, Indiana, for the year 2022. And I believe Ms. Shaw is with us again. Yes, slow on the uh, unclick. Sorry about that. Good evening. This is the third of four ordinances I'll be presenting this evening. Salary Ordinance 2137 sets 2022 pay grades and salary ranges for appointed officers, non-union, and AFSCME employees. The administration recommends a 2.75% increase, percent increase in civil city salaries. Salary ranges associated with the civil city pay grades have been adjusted to reflect that 2.75% increase. Labor's trades and craft pay rates will increase 2.5% according to their 2019 2022 collective bargaining agreement with, between the city and AFSCME. And different from past years, this ordinance reflects a one time COVID recognition payment for all regular, regular full time and part time employees $500 to regular full time employees and $300 for all regular part time employees will be distributed in January of 2022. I will now review the, the new positions, additional positions and grade changes that are in this salary ordinance. The engineering department will add a half-time administrative assistant grade four who will provide administrative support to the department. The fiscal impact is seven, about $73,000. The fire department will add two community care coordinators grade six who will provide direct support to community members before, during and after 911 emergency service interactions to facilitate continuity of care and improve patient outcomes. Fiscal impact of those two additional positions is approximately $157,000. Police will add Director of Civilian Operations, grade 10, and this position will manage divisions with the non-sworn non staff, which includes dispatch and records. The fiscal impact of this new position is about $108,000. The Office of the Clerk will add another Deputy Clerk, grade five, to assist with the office's increased workload. The fiscal impact of that increase, uh, that additional FTE is 74, for almost $75,000. The Department of Economic and Sustainable Development, customer relations representative, grade, currently grade three, has been adjusted to a grade four and will now be titled administrative assistant. This better reflects the position's responsibilities and the estimated fiscal impact of that is about $9,000. The fire department will add an additional half-time administrative assistant grade three, and this position will serve as backup to our full-time administrative assistant and provide additional assistance with the payroll, attendance, and other clerical support. The estimated fiscal impact is about $40,000. The executive assistant in the office of the mayor wants, warrants a pay grade increase after reevaluating the jobs, the position for the job, job description. The grade is currently a grade six and will increase to a grade seven. The actual Estimated fiscal impact of that change is about $5,700. Police will add four additional community service specialists, grade five, and the estimated fiscal impact of that increase is $301,000. And additionally, three telecommunicators, grade six, will be added to uh, the dispatch center of what, uh, to better address workload concerns. And the cost of that fiscal impact is about $234,000. And finally, the pay grade for the CAD RMS administrator in the police department will increase from a five to a six. The position was reevaluated re after considering the position's level of responsibility as compared to other similar positions. The estimated fiscal impact is about $1,500. In utility and meter services, the meter services representative management te technician's pay grade increased from a three to a five. This better reflects the position's responsibility and the fiscal impact is about $8,900. And finally, there are two additional changes. Uh, the two customer service representatives in the controller's department will move moving to the park division of public works, and there's no imp fiscal impact with that move. And finally, the common law pay rates in the ordinance have been updated to the, so the minimum rates are no, long, are no less than the living range of $14.01. Maximum rates have also been adjusted for some of those positions. I appreciate your consideration of this, this ordinance 2137. I'm happy to take any questions at this time. Thank you all. Thank you, Ms. Shaw. Let's go to council questions. Council member Sims. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation, Ms. Shaw. Uh, just something simple, just to help clarify me. When we're talking uh, the fiscal impact on new positions, um, in particular FTEs, and there might be 
some impact even for those that are less than full-time staff. Um, but that includes salary and benefits. And is there anything else that I'm missing for the overall fiscal impact package? I don't have the spreadsheet right in front of me. Mr. Underwood can jump in, but it includes everything, including salary, benefits, FICA, the pension payment we make for you know the type of position that it is that we, you know, we make to the Indiana PERF program. Am I forgetting anything, Mr. Underwood? Sorry to put you on the spot again, Mr. Underwood. No. Does that answer your question, Mr. Sims? Well, yeah, that was pretty succinct though. Thank you, Mr. Underwood. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yes, no, thank you very much. Thank you. Additional questions? Seeing none, let's move to public comment. So again, if you would like to offer public comment, please use the raise hand function in Zoom that is located in a number of places depending on which version of Zoom you have, uh, either on participants or reactions uh, or the more button. Um, if there is more than one individual on a given device, please let us know that so we can ensure that you have your full three minutes. Um, and with that, Mr. Lucas. Do we have any requests? I'll just remind folks who, who may wish to comment, uh, uh, you can also send a chat. Uh, oh. If you're not able to uh, find the raise hand function. See no hands raised at the moment. Any comments in chat? Not that I see, no. Okay, thank you. With that then, let's see no comments. Let's come back to council for additional questions. Council member Rollo, is that a hand or a, okay. And seeing no further questions, let's come back to council. Let's stay with council for any comment. Any final comment? Council member Rollo. Thanks. Um, I'll be passing on this. Um, I think my, my primary um, question, it's not a question, but well, perhaps it is a quandary is that um, the the community service specialists, the five community service specialists. If we're wondering where to find the resources for the base pay that we were just talking about, here it is. Um, my understanding is that, that so few calls, and 5% on average, require uh, someone who's an, a non sworn um, uh, employee. Uh, I don't see the need for this. Um, but I do need, I do see a need for sworn officers. So um, it seems like misplaced priorities. And so I'll be exploring this in the next week. Thanks. Thank you. Additional comments? Seeing none, is there a move to pass? Oh, I'm sorry, Council Member Piedmont Smith. Thank you for the extra weight. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm going to be voting no on this. Um, since uh, the August budget hearings, uh, we have asked and obtained a um, a uh, an update on how we are doing with implementation of the sustainability action plan and the climate action plan, and we are not on target. Um, I do, I do realize we had a pandemic and that has slowed down our progress. Um, However, I feel strongly that we need another employee, uh, preferably a high level employee who can devote all their time to implementing our sustainability and climate plans, uh, which present um, such an urgent uh, matter and uh, are, are really essential 
to um, to contributing in our small but important way to climate change mitigation and climate change um, reduction. And I think that it is of such importance that uh, we follow our plans. I mean, we, uh, you know, scientifically and with much um, community input created these plans. We adopted them as a council and we are not um, on track uh, by what it says, you know, in phase one or in year one uh, and two and three of the SAP. And um, I've, you know, some colleagues and I have, have spoken with the mayor about this and, uh, so it should come as no surprise that um, I am not in favor of any salary ordinance that does not include an additional position dedicated to climate action. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Rosenbarger. Thank you, I'm just on speakerphone right now. I, I just wanted to chime in and say, for the same reasons as Council Member Piedmont Smith, I plan to vote no on this. I think at the budget hearings, it became clear that um, not only are we not going to be meeting our climate action plan goals, but we really don't have someone overseeing those goals uh, in, in a cohesive way. And so we really need a director position to you know, um, implement that plan across all departments and across the entire city. So I'll be voting no on this. Thank you, Council Member Flaherty. Thank you. Um, a quick follow up that I'll be voting no on this ordinance as well for the same reasons stated by my colleagues, uh, Council Member Piedmont Smith and Rosenberger. Uh, a few quick follow up points. Um, I agree that through the course of the budget hearings in August, through other staff conversations I've had, and through the answers to questions we've received based on those budget hearings, uh, it's fairly clear to me that we do not have the capacity or political will, I suppose, at the moment to implement the 290 actions in our climate action plan that this council's approved and the city developed uh, within the eight year implementation timeframe. Uh, we're not really that close. We don't have a good plan in place to do so. Uh, I think it's probably gonna be both funding and staff capacity issues, but staff capacity are definitely a big part of it. I did wanna note though, that um, this is not at all um, uh, an indictment or criticism of our existing staff, who I think do a great job with the time they have um, to, to do what they can with regard to, to our plans. So uh, I just wanted to clarify as well that, that this is not um, a criticism of staff. It's just a, a matter of uh, priorities with respect to the plans we have and the um, desire to see them through within, within the specified timeframes. Uh, one final note that uh, I'm still exploring this a bit, but there are a fair number of cities that have um, either directors of sustainability or climate initiatives or offices of sustainability or offices of climate action that are housed uh, within the mayor's department or within the town manager's department uh, in a number of cases. Uh, and specifically in recognition that the types of actions called for by um, uh, climate action planning and, and climate resilience planning are um, really cross departmental, cross city, cross community, and require that type of uh, integration with um, other other uh, departments and cabinet level positions. So I, I don't think it's, um, I, I appreciate the conversations I've had with the mayor about this and that, you know, the reasonable minds can differ about the best approach to uh, ensuring implementation of the climate action plan, but I, I don't think it's um, uncommon or unreasonable to, to think that a, a director level position ideally integrated within the office of the mayor is um, uh, perhaps what's best and a good model from other cities that are that are doing a lot on this front and our leaders on this front uh, to address uh, some of the challenges we're facing currently with, with capacity issues. So uh, that's it for my remarks on that particular um, issue. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments? Council Member Rollo? This is starting round two, just so everyone knows. Any more round one? Okay, Council Member Allo, please go ahead. Well, thank you. Uh, well, my co colleagues make a, a very compelling uh, point here. And uh, I also note that uh, we're behind on the sustainability action plan. Uh, although recognizing the pandemic had a, probably uh, some impact on that. Um, 
the, the, the original intention of having a sustainability director was to be in the mayor's office. Um, Councilmember Pete Mount Smith and I uh, argued in a previous administration for that to be the case, and uh, we finally accepted it in economic and sustainable development, I suppose, in a sense, because that department was focused so, um, it was so weighted toward um, growth and, and it wasn't really taking into account um, the possibilities of implementing sustainability. So it seemed to be a good fit at the time, but it seems to me that, you know, we need somebody who is going to be, I think Councilmember Piedmont Smith said a czar at one point. Uh, and I think that's a good, um, maybe a good placeholder um, to, to make sure that the plan is implemented to report to council to at least explain why it's not the case or what needed resources should be made available. So um, I, I will join you uh, in voting no in a plea that, uh, that that be recognized in this budget. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Volan. I wasn't going to speak, but uh, Council Member Rallo's comments uh, made me want to chime in. I was uh, around at the time and Art made the same argument about uh, that you know sustainability needing to be a cabinet level position. Uh, position I still hold, um, and uh, uh, you know I am encouraged by uh, these these many comments. Uh, I think that uh, we have plans and people in charge of implementing all of our other plans. We're trying to hire a TDM manager. We have a transportation plan. Uh, we have a planning department to implement the comprehensive plan. Um, you know, uh, what we haven't done uh, is assign somebody whose primary task was implementing the climate action plan. And it's time we did. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Sandberg. Thank you. Uh, with respect to everything that's been said, um, I know those of us that have been appealing to the administration to do right by the police department for, for low these many years, not just this year, but it's been, you know, at least a year or two. Um, one of the things that kind of has been said to us, as I guess, as a response or as a pushback is, well, you know, we can't fund everything we want to do. And if we do, we're going to have to raise taxes. And to that, I say, um, well, that's certainly one way of making sure that our city is being responsible for all of the things that we need to be responsible for. But I would also say that we can also prioritize. We can take look at the budget, we can see what can be put on hold, what can wait, what are maybe amenities versus what are the essentials, and we can cut things in order to do what we are tasked to do. And so I do think whether you're on um, opposed to this budget because of the climate action shortfalls or you're opposed because of the uh, failure to commit to public safety in, in, a, in a more comprehensive way, I will assert where there is a will, where there is a political will, and where your community guides you, there is a way to make our budget work. So for this one, um, uh, just on, on, a, on a principle, I will abstain. Thank you. Additional comments? Council Member Flaherty? Yes, thank you. Uh, is the second round appropriate? Uh, second round, right yes. OK, thank you. Um, just, just two very small follow-ups. One is that, uh, uh, along with a few colleagues who recommended specifically this position um, uh, via writing in, in past correspondence with the mayor, uh, we we also proposed how to fund it, and I may get into that in in our conversations of the civil city budget. So, just wanted to address that point. But second is um, uh, just following up on Councilmember Volan's points. Um, again, I would I would say that our assistant director of sustainability probably is the person tasked with implementing the climate action plan. And uh, so I think we do have that. It's just, again, to me, a capacity issue that it, it probably takes multiple people. Um, I mentioned a few departments. Uh, City of Cleveland has a, an office of, uh, shoot, I forget that. <laughs> I'm not going to remember offhand the name of the department, but it's an eight-person department housed in the office of the mayor um, that is tackling climate and sustainability. Uh, granted, they're a city of 350,000 or something like that, so much bigger than, than we are. But um, it's, it's, to me, not just a, a sort of, organizational and, and hierarchical um, issue, including, um, you know, 
being at a lateral stage with other department heads, but also a capacity issue. We might need multiple staff to implement the ambitious plan that we've developed and approved. So thank you. Thank you. Additional round two comments. Seeing none, are there anyone would like a round three? And seeing none, I'll take a motion for due pass. Move due pass. Second. Thank you. Um, just going as I see people on the screen, Council Member Sims. Yes. Council Member Flaherty? No. Council Member Piedmont Smith? No. Council Member Smith? Yes. Council Member Sandberg? Pass. Council Member Rollo? No. Council Member Volan? No. Council Member Rosenberger? No. And Council Member Scambaluri, I will pass. Uh, so that is two yes, five no, two abstain, two pass. So thank you, everyone. Moving to Ordinance 2138 to fix the salaries of all elected city officials for the city of, city of Bloomington for the year 2022. Ms. Shaw, welcome back for your final time with us. Thank tonight. you. Thank you for having me. Ordinance 2138 sets the maximum 22 salary rates for the city of Bloomington elected officials, which includes the mayor, city council members, and the city clerk. These maximum salaries represent a 2.75% increase and consistent with the current ordinance, Ordinance 2138 assigns an additional 1,000 per year for city council president and 800 per year for city council vice president due to the additional responsibilities of these positions. The approval of this ordinance is requested. I'm happy to take any questions at this time. Thank you. Any council questions? Seeing none, let's go to public comment. If you would like to offer public comment, please use the raise hand function in Zoom, uh, which will likely either be under participants or reactions or the more button, depending on the version you have. Uh, if you are on a cell phone, you can press star nine, I believe. Is that correct, Mr. Lucas? Folks who have called in over the phone, right. uh, not necessarily just a, a cell phone, but yes, if you're dialed in, uh, you can press star nine to uh, raise your hand or uh, you're welcome to send a message over chat to uh, let us know you'd like to speak that way. And again, if there is more than one person on a single device, please let us know that so we can ensure that everybody has their appropriate time. Mr. Lucas. I don't see any speakers at the moment. Or anything in chat? No. Seeing no public comment, let's come back to council for any additional questions or any questions. Seeing none, would anyone like to offer final comments? Council Member Volan. I'll be abstaining on this uh, uh, ordinance for the same reason that I'm voting no on some other ones. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comment. Seeing none, is there a move to pass? Are we ready to move forward? Move to pass. Thank you. Second. Okay. And Council Member Flaherty. Yes. Council Member Piedmont Smith. Yes. Council Member Smith. Yes. Council Member Sandberg. Yes. Council Member Rollo. Abstain. Council Member Volan. Abstain. Council Member Rosenberger. Yes. Council Member Sims? Yes. 
And Council Member Scambaluri, yes. So that is seven yes, zero no, two pass, two abstain. Thank you, everyone. That finishes up the ordinances that we'll be working on tonight. We're now moving into appropriation ordinances, starting with 2103, an ordinance adopting a budget for the operation, maintenance, debt service, and capital improvements for the water and wastewater utility departments of the city of Bloomington, Indiana for the year 2022. And I believe we have Mr. Kelson with us. Mr. Kelson, thank you for coming. Good evening, council members. Uh, I'm Vic Kelson, the director of utilities uh, for CBU. And uh, we haven't made any changes uh, since the hearings. Uh, and uh, we, uh, our 2022 budget is very similar to our 2021 budget. A lot of what we're going to be doing is finishing projects that began uh, in 2021. Uh, the budget does not reflect any potential additional revenue that we might receive uh, at the completion of the waterworks rate case uh, at this time. So uh, I'm happy to take any questions and uh, thank you so much for having me tonight. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Kelson. Council member Piedmont Smith. Yes, um, Mr. Kelson, if the rate case is successful, um, would you come back for another appropriation or how does that work? Uh, the way it works is that uh, our, uh, we, we, don't need to, we don't need to come back for that during the year. What we will do is uh, a lot of the, the, the additional revenue is dedicated towards uh, continuing our, uh, our paying our O&M costs as they, in, as they inflate in the future and also uh, they cover a lot of capital costs. So uh, the monies, uh, the, those, those dollars will be accumulating during the year. The main thing we're going to be doing uh, for the capital expenditures in 2022 uh, will be offset by the, the, the bonding uh, uh, issue that council's already approved uh, related to this rate case. So what we'll, what we'll mostly be doing is selling bonds to take on a bunch of, of important Recording projects. Recording stopped. Recording in can, progress. That was, sorry about that. Uh, the, uh, uh, we will be taking on the, uh, we will be selling bonds to pay for the projects that we uh, are doing next year and to, uh, to continue uh, water main replacement. So we will be paying off the additional debt service as the money accumulates during the year, but it accumulates slowly over the course of the year. It doesn't all come at once. I hope that makes sense. I feel like I got distracted there. <laughs> um, and when would the new rates go into effect? Well, we're in, we're hopeful uh, that we're going to uh, have a settlement uh, hearing at IURC sometime in October. Uh, and if that's the case, we would anticipate the, the new rate tariff would go into effect at the 1st of January. I see. So that's still on track. Yeah. Thank you. A few additional questions, Council Member Sims. Thank you. Thank you again, Mr. Kelson. Um, I was just wondering if, in fact, we are successful with the um, rate case, what do you anticipate the revenue increase to be? Um, in round terms, uh, it was we, we asked for 22%. Uh, we're going to probably be uh, smaller than that. Uh, so uh, that's on about a budget of, or a, a revenue stream of about 15 million. So it's going to be in the two and a half to $3 million a year additional revenue range. Okay, thank you. Additional questions? Council Member Sandberg, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Kelson. Would you like to take this public opportunity to talk about the status of the drinking water? Uh, yeah, sure. I had a feeling this was going to come up. Uh, well, uh, this late summer, we had a very unusual situation where it remained in the 90s all the way into late September, uh, and we had a long stretch with no rainfall. Uh, and what happened uh, was uh, we do uh, monitor uh, algal populations in the water that, that is coming into the plant. Um, we've been doing a lot of that testing uh, by sending it off to labs. So it's 
one of those things that there's a, a fairly significant delay between the time it goes to the lab and the time it comes back. Um, so uh, there's a, a, there are a pair of, of chemicals, uh, MIB and Josman methyl iso uh, borneol is the, uh, what MIB stands for. Um, and they naturally occur in, in surface waters and in lakes. So the, that, the taste and odor issues are really common in summertime uh, with water that comes from lakes. Now, in 2016, we made some treatment changes at the plant. Uh, a lot of those changes were oriented towards managing disinfection byproducts. But one of the things we started doing was regularly feeding activated carbon in the summertime. So basically, we put a Brita filter in the plant. Um, and, and that helps take out those taste and odor com compounds, as well as helps us manage the precursors for, uh, for disinfection byproducts. Uh, what happened this year was we got a much larger slug uh, there for, for about a week of the, of the taste and odor compounds. And frankly, we hadn't had a taste and odor complaint since 2016. So uh, uh, I, I don't think anybody, any of our customers was ready for it. Uh, and I, and I, while we monitor it, it's uh, not the kind of thing that just, it, when it happens, it just sort of jumps out at you. So we've been talking a lot about what, what we're going to do next year. Uh, we have a device uh, called a FlowCam that uh, we purchased uh, late last year. Uh, that device allows us to do uh, automated scanning and algal counts and including speciation of the types of algae that are coming into the plant. Uh, we'll be able to look more closely uh, on an ongoing basis, even a daily basis, to see if uh, we're starting to see a blue, the onset of a bloom, and then we'll make, uh, we can make uh, treatment adjustments uh, as in, in anticipation of what, uh, of what happened uh, last week. So uh, that's what we did ultimately when, when we got the, 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 the taste complaints uh, we, we increased the uh, feed rate of a couple of our of treatment chemicals, including the activated carbon, uh, and that knocked it out at the plant pretty quickly, but the water takes seven to 10 days to get to the ends of our distribution system. And depending on if your home happens to be on a dead end or a partial dead end or, or whatnot, uh, it just may take a couple of weeks to clear out. Uh, we have been doing some additional flushing. Uh, to, to try and get it out of the system. And uh, it, it is getting, it, it is mostly gone. Our, our number of complaints has gone, gone way down. Uh, but, you know, doggone it, uh, we had it, we thought we had this completely under control and it, uh, and we had an unusually large bloom this fall. So next year, next year, we'll, we'll be watching for it next time. Thank you. Help us on the way. I appreciate that update. Thank you. Additional questions? Councilmember Rollo. Director Kelson, could you, um, so I'm curious about this, is, is the, is the algal bloom, is it algae or is it cyanobacteria or is it other types of bacteria? Uh, these were, what these is, were, these were cyanobacteria. They were blue, blue greens. And I do want to point out that, by the way, the, I forgot to say this when I was talking a moment ago, the water was always safe to drink. It, it smelled and tasted funny, but it was always safe to drink. None, none of those, uh, there were no uh, toxic chemicals in it or anything like that. So my other question is, do you, um, do you sample as the water is leaving the plant? In other words- We sample on the way, of... yeah, we sample way in and on the way out. Okay, so you're, so you're aware in real time that there could be a problem in terms of Taste, yeah, we can, in terms of organics, and, and for taste, the way we we uh, the, the we taste we test for taste and odor as we taste the, the plant. Um, so uh, the the operators um, actually, this is an interesting thing. The 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 particular uh, incident we had this time, a lot of people couldn't smell it, but you could taste it, and so at the plant, our the the standard practice has always been to to take a sample and smell it. And, uh, and uh, so now we're taking, we're taking sample and smelling it and also tasting it because uh, that was an unusual circumstance that came up. 
So would you say that, you know, this is good what you're implementing right now, but ultimately what we need to do is uh, care for the watershed and prevent, you know, the types of nutrients that these organisms cause, will cause blooms. I, I know you, you know, it is caused by temperature increases and lack of rain and, and that sort of thing, but, you know, we, we, we have concerns about the quality of the source as well. Um, well, do you we, think we do, attention we do to that would help? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to step on you there. No, no. Um, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. It's, um, we do pay attention to that, and we are, um, we are assisting with watershed activities in, in a yeah. number of different ways. But uh, it's, it is really notable that the problem we had last week is a problem we had every year from May till September for decades, taking water from this lake. Um, it, it was no worse than it had ever been before. I remember when I was in graduate school, every summer you, you knew it was coming. Uh, when, when the summertime came, that, the, that the, the water would start to get that kind of a lakey taste sometimes. Not every day, but, but, but uh, sometimes. And then in 2016, my first year here, uh, we, we had hundreds of taste and odor complaints that summer, all summer long, uh, because it had always been, it, the, this is just a, a sort of endemic in surface water systems associated with reservoirs. But you're right. Uh, over time, we want to make sure that we're making that the that we're adding as little additional uh, nutrient loading to the to to the watershed and to the lake as we possibly can. A lot of that's planning and zoning. Uh, some of that's going to actually have to be projects in the watershed and and so forth. But uh, and global warming has a role. Uh, when we have uh, giant rain events that wash a whole bunch of additional sediment into the lake. That brings down a lot of, of, of nutrients from decaying plant matter and so forth. So, uh, it's all of these things are all, all of these challenges are arrayed against us, and all we can do is do the best we can to make sure that we're treating it and and paying close attention and investing in the right kind of work. Thank you for that comprehensive answer. Thank you. Additional questions. Seeing none, let's move into public comment. Again, this is public comment on ordinance 21, or appropriation ordinance 2103. Uh, if you'd like to offer a comment, please use the raise hand function in Zoom, which is under um, participants or reactions or the more button. If you are participating by cell phone, you can use star nine or all, all that failing, you can type a comment into chat. And Mr. Lucas, We'll be watching it. And if you have more than one person on a single device, please let us know uh, so we can ensure that everyone has the allotted time. So, Mr. Lucas. See no requests for comment at the moment. And anything in chat? I don't believe so, no. Okay. Thank Recording you. Recording stopped. I, I wonder why. I'm not going to. Recording in progress. I, there are several uh, co-hosts on the meeting. I don't know if someone's uh, clicking that accidentally. So um, I still have no requests for comment. Thank you. Thank you. Let's come back to council for additional questions. Council Member Sims. Thank you. Um, I'm not so sure if it's a question, but um, I was wondering if um, Mr. Kelson can speak about staffing. Um, uh, we've been talking a lot about staffing um, and how we're running tight and minimally. So how are we doing in utilities? Well, right now, uh, the, the, we do have some staffing challenges uh, in um, in uh, transmission and distribution. Uh, those are the folks that are out there fixing main breaks and uh, installing pipes and all of those kinds of things. Uh, the construction industry right now is just so active that, uh, and that wages have gone up all over the place. 
And uh, even uh, one of the utility organizations near us uh, has raised some of their wages. And uh, that affects our ability to retain and recruit. Um, we have, uh, we've lost a number of people. We've had some that were retirements um, and we've had some that have left just because there's pretty good money out there uh, for, for people in this industry. So um, we are working uh, with, uh, with um, uh, City Hall. We've been working with HR and we've talking with the controller and, uh, and the legal department about what kinds of things we might be able to do to, uh, to be uh, more effective in retention and uh, recruitment. Uh, especially for the, the really highly skilled uh, uh, people who have to operate a backhoe around other buried infrastructure. Those people are hard to find. Um, and that's a really technical, uh, technical skill that takes a real professional to do it properly. So uh, that's one of the places where we've had the most trouble, but we're getting a uh, good, good support from, from, uh, from the administration uh, in these efforts. And uh, we'll be, we're, we're going to be continuing to pursue them. At the plants, we are fully staffed at the plants, except for we have one operator position open at Monroe. Uh, we've had some turnover, not associated with uh, with uh, that, that that's not associated with any specific concerns. Uh, just people moving away and things like that, in, in some of the other departments. But T and D is where it's been pretty tough. We've had a lot of churn over there in the last year. Thank you. Um, and I think I heard um, in a meeting the other day we're at double digits short staffed. Um, but the biggest, the big, yeah, I'm sorry. 16 vacancies. Yeah. Um, but one of the biggest issues are heavy equipment operators, uh, which are very skilled and in great demand. Um, so thank you. I just want to share that with the public so that um, more people are aware of the challenges actually that um, not only other departments, but yours as well are going through. So thank you very much. And they are great jobs. So people should be on the, people are looking for, for jobs. Please be watching for a utilities jobs. It's a great industry to be in. Thank you. Thank you. Additional questions? In which case, let's go into final comment. Are there any final comments? Seeing none, is there a move to pass? Move to pass. Thank you. Second. Thank you. So um, just going down the list as I see them, um, Council Member Sandberg? Yes. Council Member Smith? Yes. Council Member Piedmont Smith? Yes. Council Member Flaherty? Yes. Council Member Sims? Yes. Council Member Rosenbarger? Yes. Council Member Volan? Yes. Council Member Rollo? Yes. And Council Member Scambaluri? Yes. That is nine yes, zero no, zero pass. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Have a good evening. Thank you. You too. Moving to Appropriation Ordinance 21-04, Appropriations and Tax Rates for Bloomington Transportation Corporation for 2022. Um, just by way of reminder to the public comment portion uh, of this deliberation will constitute the statu statutorily required public hearing on the transit budget for 2022. And we have Mr. May with us. Welcome, Mr. May. Good evening, Lou May, General Manager with the Bloomington Public Transportation Corporation for one more day. And uh, I will officially retire starting on Friday, October 1st. And tonight, before I uh, make my budget commentary, if, if the council would allow, I would love to introduce to you my successor, Mr. John Connell, if that's okay, if that meets you, the council's please. approval. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll let Mr. Connell introduce himself and make, make a few brief remarks. Mr. Connell, welcome. Thank you. Good evening. Can you see me? Yes, perfect. Oh, okay, great. Uh, just, uh, it's great to be back in Bloomington. I'm an IU grad, so uh, 
pretty familiar with the city. Happy to be back. A little bit about myself. I've been in public transportation my whole professional career. Uh, most recently in Lafayette with City Bus as the ma uh, manager of operations. Prior to that, I was in the transit director in Evansville, Indiana. So I look forward to working with each of you uh, independently or collectively uh, to discuss any concerns or ideas that you may have. Uh, and uh, I know I have a, a tough assignment ahead of me to fill uh, Lou's shoes. He's done a fantastic job and uh, uh, he's been working with me to prepare me to, for the transition. So uh, it's great to be here. Thank you. Great. Mr. Connell, welcome. Good to have you with us. So, Mr. May. Thank you. Uh, with respect to our proposed 2022 budget, there have been no changes to the budget from what I originally presented to the council in August. We are proposing a 2022 budget of $15,114,394 compared to a 2021 budget of $14,505,793. And that's about a four. 0.2% increase over the 2021 budget. Uh, with that, I'm glad to entertain any comments or questions that the council may have. Questions for Mr. May, Ms. Uh, council member Piedmont Smith. Yes, thank you, Mr. May. And good to meet you, Mr. Connell. Um, I, uh, my question is about the tax rate. Um, so it comes to 0 0.0443 for proposed for next year, what was the tax rate for this year? Uh, that is a good question. I think it's approximately about a four and a half percent increase over what it currently is. I, I don't have the, the current rate in front of me, but you could probably do the reverse math to, uh, based on a four and a half percent increase. I will do that, thank you. Council member, thank you. Council member Volan. Yes, Mr. May, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I, I wonder if you could just share with us uh, how the um, ridership numbers are looking with the beginning of the new school year, a year after the pandemic. How are things going? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, ridership is about 62% of normal compared to what we were during a normal pre-pandemic school year. So, uh, and that's on the fixed route side. We're a little bit higher on the BT access side, about 68% of normal on BT access. Do you see the numbers trending upwards or is it holding steady? Oh, they, they are definitely trending upwards compared to what was happening during the height of the pandemic there. And of course, IU has returned to in-person classes and, and that's really the prime reason that a ridership is trending upward compared to the midst of the pandemic. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, additional questions. Seeing none, I'll, I'll jump in quickly to follow up on Council Member Volan's question. Um, you mentioned we are at 62% of normal, so to speak. Um, how does that compare to other college towns? Do you have a sense of that? I, I don't. I, I haven't asked questions of, of my colleagues in the industry and other college towns, but um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we're a little bit further down compared to some other communities. One of the problems that one of the challenges that we're having is, as has been talked about with some of the other department meetings, uh, we too are shorthanded on staff right now. We're running about 80% of what our normal fixed route driver staff would be. And uh, that's been a significant challenge for us. And as such, we're not able to put out as much service as we would like to put out. Uh, I know other transit systems are facing that same challenge. I'm not sure if they're to the same degree that it's practicing here in Bloomington. Thank you, appreciate that. Additional questions? Seeing none, let's move to public comment. If we would welcome comment, public comment on appropriation ordinance 2104 now, 
Again, this constitutes the statutorily required public hearing on the transit budget. If you would like to offer a comment, please use the raise hand function in Zoom, um, which is available under the reactions tab or the participants tab or the more tab. Uh, if you're participating by cell phone, you can use star nine uh, or one final option is to type a message in chat and our meeting host will let us know that, that you have an interest in commenting. So with that, Mr. Lucas. We have no requests for comment at the moment. Okay. Let's just give it a few more moments. And I'm not seeing any pop up. Anything in chat, Mr. Lucas? No, I don't believe so. Okay. Seeing no further comment, let's come back to council for additional questions. Seeing none, is there final comment? Council Member Volan, then Council Member Sims. I have a feeling I may be saying things that other members will be saying, but uh, I just want to say I'll be supporting this budget and, uh, and no small thanks due to the long tenure and good stewardship of Lou May. And Mr. May will, will miss your wise counsel and your steady hand at the steering wheel. And uh, we hope that you have an excellent retirement that you not uh, forget us. And I'm sure that uh, Mr. Connell has big shoes to fill, but I, I'm not sure he'll do a good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Sims. Thank you. And thank you again for your years of service, Lou. I'm sorry, Mr. May. Um, <laughs> I think I can call you Lou. Um, and it's nice to meet Mr. Connell. And I look forward to um, personally meeting with him. And I'm sure as many as my colleagues do as well. Um, um, but again, just want to thank you. I hope you enjoy your retirement and look forward. I thought, thought I saw some pictures of you with some nice large fish out on the lake somewhere. Um, but one of the things I'm most grateful for is as another department head, um, you've always been respected as far as I know amongst your colleagues, um, in particular, my wife and I are just crazy about Lou um, and, and how you treat people and your, your uh, professionalism and respect. What's important to me is that I, you have always been respectful for me even before I was elected to city council. So that kind of lets people know the kind of person you are even back when I couldn't help with your budget or vote or do any other thing, you were still reaching out and working with some community needs and um, doing some things to help make this a better community. And I truly appreciate that and want to thank you for that and enjoy your retirement, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Rosenbarger, then Council Member Rollo. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. May, for your service. It has been a pure delight working with you. Similar to Council Member Sims, um, I was just thinking about how you would meet with me even just when I was running for office. And so we got to know each other way back in 2019 when I had a million questions about Bloomington Transit. So I think your you know, your ability to just meet and answer all the questions and like really take the time to let us understand everything has been just wonderful for me. I will miss working with you. It's just really been a delight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Rollo. Uh, I want to say that it's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Connell, and uh, it's been an honor and pleasure to work with you, uh, Lou. Uh, it's been a uh, this is our 19th, my 19th budget with you. And uh, I, I wish you all, all the best going Thank forward. You Thank you. Council Member Piedmont Smith. Yes, I, I want to add my thanks uh, to Mr. May, um, all the, the times that he's met with me and discussed issues uh, related to transit and also how responsive he's been when constituents have had concerns. I really appreciate that. I think uh, he's, he's a true public servant and uh, we will miss you, Thank you. Uh, Mr. May. Um, 
and you've you've seen the the end of your tenure was was quite difficult with uh, you know the delays in implementing the the route changes because of the pandemic, the drastic reduction in ridership and and the struggles in staffing. So um, I hope you still feel like you're you're going out on a high note because uh, we know it would have been a lot worse if you hadn't been at the helm. So thank you very much. Thank you. Councilmember Sandberg. Thank you. Well, welcome aboard, Mr. Connell, and bon voyage, Mr. May. I don't know if sailing is in your future, but I hope uh, you have a great next chapter to the rest of your really distinguished career. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks so much. Thank you. Additional comments? Councilmember Smith. I just want to say thank you, Mr. May. Thank you for all you've done. You helped when uh, we had questions at Area 10 and uh, helped facilitate some access for some elderly and disabled people uh, with your staff and you. So thank you very much and uh, bon voyage. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Flaherty. Thank you. Just another strong voice of thanks to, to Mr. May for all his many years of service and uh, help with this body's uh, efforts over the year. I know over the years, I know uh, Bloomington is a much better place uh, for all the advocacy that, that Mr. May did for transit. And also a welcome to Mr. Connell. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And, and I'll just conclude by adding my thanks as well. Uh, and just for fun, I went back, I, I tend to keep pretty copious notes of meetings. So I went back through uh, meeting notes from the conversations you and I have had over the last couple of years. And I count and I keep track of my questions and I counted 138 questions that I've asked you. Um, so 108, 38 thank yous and more. So thank you. Well, okay. With that, is there a move to pass? So move to pass. Thank you. Second. Thank you all. Um, and just going around, Council Member Rollo. Yes. Council Member Volan? Yes. Council Member Rosenbarger? Yes. Council Member Sims? Yes. Council Member Flaherty? Council Member Piedmont Smith? Yes. Council Member Smith? Yes. Council Member Sandberg? Yes. And Council Member Scambaluri? Yes. That is nine yes, zero no's, zero pass. But thank you so much. It's been a pleasure working with each of you over the years, and uh, I, I'll miss everything uh, about Bloomington Transit. I, I'll still be in the community, and I'll be watching with great interest as BG grows and thrives. So again, thanks so much. Thank you, Mr. May. Thank you, Mr. May. Our final piece of legislation tonight is Appropriation Ordinance 21-02 an ordinance for appropriations and tax rates, establishing the 2022 civil city budget for the city of Bloomington. Um, and also by way of reminder here, the public comment portion of the deliberation on this item will constitute the statutorily required public hearing on the city budget for 2022. And I believe we're welcoming Mr. Underwood. Good evening, Jeff Underwood, city controller. Uh, first would like to thank uh, Stephen Lucas for allowing me to follow uh, Lou May. Uh, and, and that, uh, good luck to Lou. Uh, I wish uh, there had been somebody in between us. So <laughs> uh, he and I are both fishermen at heart. So uh, heartfelt thanks to him for all that he's done and, and thanks for all the pictures of, uh, on vacation. Uh, tonight, uh, I'll hit some highlights on the budget and then we get to um, uh, questions and comments. As noted, this is the public hearing. Uh, this was duly advertised through uh, Gateway Online. Uh, which is the requirement, and um, it was advertised on uh, September 17th, 12 days before the public hearing, and the requirement is 10 days, so we successfully did that. Uh, 2021 and 2020 have been uh, uh, difficult years uh, in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, we continue to adjust, uh, persevere, and try to overcome. Uh, we continue to ask department heads to uh, scrutinize their spending both last year and this year and going into 2022. 
uh, as we look to see how things are going to uh, improve or not. Uh, in a few areas, we've seen improvement. Uh, we have lost significant revenues, especially in food and beverage, uh, parts department, street department, uh, to name a few. Uh, and we don't expect to see a full recovery for some time. As uh, I've noted before, government tends to lag behind uh, any downturn in the economy uh, and takes a little bit longer to recover. Uh, the good news is, though, uh, with CARES and uh, the uh, Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act and ARPA, American Rescue Plan Act, uh, we have received significant uh, funds to, to help us work through that. Uh, but we'll continue to be diligent. We'll continue to monitor uh, the pace of the investments and be ready to adjust quickly over the next 18 months. Uh, cash reserves, we continue to be in a strong position. We ended uh, 2020 with 38.8%. That's about four months of the city's general fund. Uh, we're projecting those levels to be 29.1% uh, at the end of this year and 23.6% at the end of 22. Uh, looking at an 18-month projection, we think we'll be at about 25% at the end of, of 2022. Uh, property taxes continue to be um, the bulk of the funding for the general fund, uh, and they represent about 53.7% of our total revenues. And as noted, uh, that went up 4.3% for 2022. Again, that's based on a seven-year rolling average of non-farm income across the state, and every unit of government gets the same uh, growth quotient, regardless of the local economy. Uh, local income tax uh, is our second largest source. It's about 26.5% in the general fund. Uh, it composed of three different buckets, distributive shares, economic development, and public safety lit. Uh, currently, uh, the city of Monroe County has enacted two of those, the distributive shares, which goes to a wide variety of uh, uh, governmental units, and then public safety lit, uh, which goes to uh, Ellettsville, Steinsville, the county, and the city of Bloomington. Uh, would note that as a result of the extension for filing of state returns in 2020, with, for the year 2019, uh, the state is projecting a reduction of just over a million dollars or about 7.8% in our lit for 2022. Uh, also would note that uh, we'll get uh, tomorrow, or. Uh, take that back on uh, Friday, revised projections on that as well. So we'll update you uh, when we come back to the next meeting. There won't be anything that we can really do uh, regardless, but we'll know that it, I, I'm expecting they'll probably confirm the amounts. Uh, th that Those two uh, to uh, combined property taxes and local income taxes account for over 80% of the funding in the general fund. Miscellaneous revenues, these are fees for services, fines, interest income, uh, federal and state reimbursements and so on account for about 20% uh, of our total budget. Uh, as noted uh, last time uh, in last year, in this current year's budget, we elected to uh, recover forward and use money out of our reserves. And we appropriated um, $2 million out of the rainy day fund into the general fund. Uh, we're not electing to do that for 2022. Uh, therefore, that's the uh, biggest decrease in our miscellaneous revenues. Uh, on expenditures for all funds, uh, the total budget is $106,961,000, uh, about 11.9% or uh, $11.9 million increase or 12 and percent. The vast majority, overwhelming majority is uh, due to a million dollars in CARES uh, money that we're appropriating and $10.085 million out of the ARPA funds. Uh, with those changes, we'd actually have seen an overall decrease in the budget. I uh, would like to note uh, one of the changes uh, was into the ARPA funding. Uh, there was a transfer of $150,000 from HAND to ESD to more properly uh, align a program there. Uh, there was a $50,000 reduction uh, due to a duplication of programs that was funded uh, in another area. And then, as the mayor not uh, noted, a $400,000 increase uh, to the police for a net increase of $350,000 uh, in the ARPA fund. Uh, all the other funds uh, stayed the same. Uh, the overall budget for the general fund is $49.9 million. This is an increase of uh, 1.4 or 2.8%. Uh, this also includes a million dollars of care funds and a $224,000 decrease in property tax ca uh, caps. Uh, 
and that would uh, accounting for those would only uh, account for a 1.2 percent change in compared to 2021. Uh, one change that was made in the general fund budget was a, a transfer. It did not increase or decrease the amount of the request, but it decreased the sanitation general fund supplement from 1.6 million to 1.5 and moved $100,000 into the uh, human resources budget uh, to be utilized for the uh, parking cash out pilot uh, program that the mayor mentioned earlier. Um, Parks General Fund, their overall request is 9.7 million. Uh, this is an increase of 1.3 or 15.5%. Uh, public safety uh, is used to fund um, central dispatch uh, to the tune of $2.9 million, or a, to a total budget of 2.9 and um, uh, a PS lit and a million 345 from E911 and then police and fire, $3.1 million. Uh, the other exhibits uh, remain the same. I won't go over those, uh, and I would be happy to answer questions. Uh, my fellow department heads here are here as well and can answer questions specific to their particular departments. And thank you again. And one other note uh, to make that I should have made at the beginning was um, this is a transition from uh, August where we present uh, program budgets uh, which are each department breaks down their activities by programs and activities and, and uh, budgeted uh, estimated budget amounts, estimated staffing, and estimated population serves. We now move to the more formal process, uh, which is the forms uh, required uh, to be submitted to the Department of Local Government Finance. And hence, you get a uh, ordinance that lists all the uh, funds, the maximum amounts uh, at requested for those, and um, the maximum levies uh, if a fund has those. In this particular case, uh, the city general fund and parks general fund are the main levies. Uh, then you have three bond funds uh, that get a property tax uh, levy and their own rate. And then finally, the cumulative capital development fund, uh, which gets a rate of five cents uh, that gets adjusted each year as well. So those are your levy accounts. Uh, the ordinance is also broken out into state uh, required funds and then local um, home rule funds so that you see those bifurcated in the ordinance um, that is presented. With that, I'll stop speaking and happy to answer questions. Thank you, Mr. Underwood. Uh, let's come to council for questions. Council member Piedmont Smith. Yes, thank you, Mr. Underwood. Um, I had a question about the, um, the PS lit funding. Um, maybe I'm missing something, but it seems like the, the actuals in the budget legislation are a lot higher than what we were working with on the PS lit committee in August. Is that just a matter of having updated figures? So in August, we were working with a little over 6 million as our estimate of, for PSAP and the certified shares. And the actuals I see here are 7.8 million. I know the numbers that have presented were what we uh, received from the, um, the state. Um, our share will be right around $6 million. Uh, for uh, split $2.9 million for central dispatch and $3.1 million for police and fire. The okay. other million, the other million three is E911 money that comes through the county for um, dispatch. Okay, I'll have to see where I got the 7.8 million figure. Maybe it included that. I... I believe if you had all three of those together, yeah, you'll come up with about 7.8, but one point. $3 million is E911 money. Okay. Central Dispatch gets two funding sources, PS Lit, that the committee and the council will vote on, uh, but we present their entire budget so you have an idea of what the full funding amounts are, and that includes $1,345,000 from the, from the E911. Okay. I'll, I'll look back and see where I got that. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Additional questions? Council Member Smith. Um, thank you for the presentation, Mr. Underwood. Uh, can you thumbnail me uh, how much is reverted each year? 
to uh, going back to the general fund? Uh, that'll, that varies from year to year. Um, we, in the past, the mayor has um, indicated to department heads that uh, anything that's reverted back, half of it would be ava made available to departments uh, for uh, items that maybe it weren't we weren't able to fund um, that were a priority within the department. Uh, we've not done that this for this year because we spent reserves down and we allowed that to be, we factored that into uh, our calculations of the the available reserves. So department heads were aware of that, but we had additional spending because of the $2 million out of the rainy day fund. So many of those initiatives along with the CARES money uh, were funded that way rather than uh, through reversions. So does that mean, what does that mean to me? Uh, does that mean that 1% is reverted from the, from the total uh, budget? Does that mean, you know, 2%? Does it mean um, $2 million? Can you? Can I've you seen. I can talk more uh, in the dollar range than necessarily the um, uh, the percentages. I would have to look back. Oh, okay. I, you know, we we've seen reversions as low as uh, you know half a million dollars to um, a little over two million dollars, depending on the year. One of the things that we'll have a, a better idea is uh, this fall. We always come to you with a year end uh, appropriation uh, request. Typically in the general fund, we, we aim to have that as a zero dollar sum. So departments will have reversions, others will need additional funds. So we net it out of that. So we'll have some idea of what we think we might, uh, where we might end up with uh, for the 2021 year. And then obviously we go through your close and then the actual numbers uh, pop up, but um, right. okay. so we'll have some idea. And obviously each fund, as well. Now, the general fund, typically you, you look at your two operating funds, parks and um, the city's general obligations, because those are your two primary operating accounts that you look for uh, in a reversion fashion. And that money just reverts back into the fund and is available either to keep as reserves or uh, appropriate from that. Okay, so uh, yeah, it ranges from half a million to two million historically, and then it gets. Uh, so somewhat reappropriated uh, through various mechanisms to keep all all the departments uh, above board and going good. Correct. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Underwood. Appreciate it. Huh? Thank you. Additional questions. Additional round one questions. Seeing none, let's go to Council Member Piedmont Smith. Yes. Thank you. This is a follow up, actually. Um, so, uh, Mr. Underwood, I've, I found um, where I saw that 7.8 million, it's in budget form number four, the second page of that budget form. Um, it says uh, fund code 9505, public safety, local income tax, 7,834,979. So I'm wondering how that squares with uh, the, Six million that we discussed in the PS Select Committee. If you'll give me a minute, I'll I'll run to that fund and uh, take a look. Okay. Yes, that the 7.389 is miscellaneous revenues. That's inclusive of the PS lit and the E911. If you add those together, I believe they come up to 7.389. But I'm looking at 7,834,979. Fund code 9505. Oh, that's uh, you're looking at line 27 or line 17. That's the total expenditures of 7,834,978. That's the total budget. We're, we're using some cash uh, reverted money in the PS lit account for police and fire. Oh, okay. So that includes revert reversions. Yes. 
Okay. Um, I, I have another question, if I may. Please. Madam Chair. Go ahead. Um, so uh, in, in your presentation tonight, you said there was um, the appropriation in the general fund was 49.9 million. And uh, on form four, again, on the first page, when I look at the general fund, um, no, actually it is, it's- It's, it's a, it, the difference is the property tax caps. And, yeah, so the adopted budget here on page, on form four is 49.3. Three, yeah. So if you take nine million dollars, that figure that I gave you, deduct the five twenty, five ninety, you'll come up with forty nine three eighty one two nineteen. Okay. All right. So it, we. It's so just, what's it, on this form includes the deduction already. Yes. Already has the deduction on it. Right. Minus the tax caps. Okay. Yeah, it's it's the the state from year to year and, and Commissioner Volan and I always have a discussion about how the state handles the property tax cuts and how you allocate those. And uh, so you'll see on my exhibits that I have a line that shows the exact amount of that. So you all are aware of that. It basically reduces the amount that's available to us. Um, and I think this is the third the difference they have to show it. But anyway, that's the difference. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Additional questions? We're kind of in round one and a half. So, okay, if not, I'll jump in. Um, Mr. Underwood, of course, I can't let a year go by without asking you about reserves and debt level. Uh, so, so it, it's once again time to do that. Um, I understood we dipped into our reserves for COVID. And did I understand you correctly that we're not anticipating? dipping into reserves any further for the company? Uh, well, we hit a high of, of, of 58%, uh, and we, we expect to be down to about uh, 25%, which is a little less than the four months that was our target, but that was due to spending those reserves down. The Government Finance Officers Association recommends two months, which is about 17.7%. Uh, our target was 33.3, so we'll be about halfway through, but that's we're on target for where we thought we would be when we initially started discussing the recover forward dollars out of the city's uh, reserves. And when do you think, is there a timetable for when we get back up to 25% or up to 33%? Hopefully sooner than later, but it'll, it'll just depend on a number of factors. I mean, one of the things to keep in mind is that uh, not only are there labor shortages across every uh, line of business, uh, you know, government is not uh, solely the ones that experience that. Uh, but because of that, uh, there is a dearth, death, dearth of um, raw materials available to uh, make products. So prices have gone up uh, exponentially. I mean, we've seen on our, when we're going out for bids on capital projects, they're 25 to 50% higher than what was estimated. Um, there's a lack of availability uh, many times you can go into local stores and you'll see that the cupboards are bare uh, because we just can't get them through. So, uh, you know, it just depends on on the shortages that if prices stay up, if inflation's high, then it'll take us longer to recover uh, those reserves. But if we recover faster, then uh, we'll see it uh, come back. But uh, I, I would imagine it'll take us several years to get back up. Um, to, to the 33%, but I, I'm, I'm comfortable that we still have good reserves. I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic, but uh, certainly uh, additional revenues are gonna be something that will be on the plate of the administration and the council as we move forward, uh, especially uh, to fund, fund uh, needed uh, expenditures. Thank you, and I appreciate especially you're managing expectations, our expectations about how fast that'll recover. Um, debt level, could you talk about how we compare to some peer cities or our aspirational peers, if that's the case? <laughs> we, we, we fare very well. We, we, we are a relatively low debt load uh, per capita uh, city. Uh, you know, we look at that very judiciously. Uh, as I've talked about in the past, we, we kind of break it up into three buckets. Uh, expenditures with a life of zero to seven years, we tend to want to try and put those in our operating budgets. Uh, assets with lives 
um, seven to 15 years, we typically look at lease purchases, which tend to have uh, uh, payback periods between five and 15 years, uh, usually five to 10. And then anything over that uh, tends to go out into a bond of some type, either a revenue bond or a general obligation, which is a property tax-based uh, bond um, to fund those longer-term assets that uh, have those lives that extend extend beyond 15, you know, typically 15 to 50 year type things. And we typically do uh, 20 year bonds on those. They, in the old days, 30 years was the norm, but we found that, uh, you know, those last 10 years are really interest uh, rates have been good. Uh, we're cautiously optimistic about those as well, that those will remain down. Uh, we'll be coming to you hopefully this fall with a couple of refunding. And as uh, Vic mentioned, uh, a new utility issue uh, after the first of the year. So. Uh, we tend, you know, we, we'll continue to monitor that just like we do reserves. We don't want to get uh, too debt heavy, but uh, it is a way to fund uh, long-term um, asset needs. Sure. Do you happen to know our debt per capita right now? I do not, but I can, uh, if you will uh, send me a notice, I will look that up for you. Thank you. Thanks. Additional questions? Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Yes, Mr. Underwood, as you know, um, in late uh, 2018, the council passed an ordinance about um, any appropriations, uh, $100,000 or more, uh, that should be delineated either in the annual budget request um, or uh, uh, outlined to the council separately before the expenditure is made if there's a transfer between um, between lines. So um, I just wanted to know if there's been any change since the details that were provided in August as to additional expenditures expected to be $100,000 or more. Not beyond what I, I noted with the um, in, in the city's general fund, there was a $100,000 transfer uh, from sanitation to HR, and that will be used exclusively for a parking uh, cash out pilot program. Uh, so that increased, you know, the net was zero, but it increased the um, HR department by $100,000 and decreased uh, sanitation. And then the note, uh, the changes noted in the ARPA funds where uh, a program was just reallocated from housing and neighborhood development to economic and sustainability department. A uh, fifty thousand dollar drop because that pro uh, that program was um, double double budgeted uh, that we realized after the fact in talking to the different department heads and then the four hundred thousand dollar add uh, to the police department for uh, retirement. Other than that, there were no other changes. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't quite uh, uh, hear you when you said um, the uh, the something that was double budgeted. How much was uh, we that? Drop, we dropped the overall um, ARPA request. Uh, we added $400,000 for police, but dropped $50,000 out of uh, housing and neighborhood development. Uh, we found that that, uh, that particular program, and I don't recall what the program was, had been budgeted in another department. So it essentially it was double budgeted. So we, we dropped that out. And then one program just moved from uh, and. ESD, so there was no net change there. So, uh, hundred thousand dollar transfer, one hundred and fifty fifty drop, and a four hundred add. Those are the four changes, and three of those are ARPA. So, what was it that moved from one department to another? Uh, one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. One hundred fifty. So again, no, no net impact, but just went from uh, hand to ESD. From hand. And what, what's the purpose of that money going to be in ESD? Uh, either uh, Alex Crowley or uh, Zodi could answer that particular detail. There's Mr. Zodi. Uh, thanks, Mr. Crowley. I don't know if Mr. Mr. Underwood, I don't know if Mr. Crowley is going to join me, but um, uh, Councilmember Piedmont Smith, those funds uh, were part of our uh, ARPA uh, list uh, to look at housing and turned out in our uh, thought process, one of the, the funds, the $150,000 was related to a sustainability, or rather $100,000, excuse me, was related to a sustainability program that would, uh, the aim is to uh, have 
more sustainability for solar activity and energy efficiency and things like that dedicated to homes. And that's kind of already something ESG does in one of its existing programs. So Mr. Crowley and I uh, got together and decided that money is better use in ESD. And the other program movement um, was um, actually that Mr. Underwood mentioned was double budget. It was an accessory dwelling unit program that planning transportation is going to be doing. Uh, and so that was removed from hands. ARPA allocation over the, uh, to planning because we were talking about where's the best place for that to go. And that was part of the ARPA discussion with housing and it's better implemented in planning and transportation. So that explains the, uh, that's, that's what those two programs were. And together they were 150,000? I believe so. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Just a correction, no, it's 200,000 total. It was $150,000 for the uh, first program that, um, uh, Mr. Zodi described, and then the 50,000 was uh, for the accessory dwelling. So it was a total of 200. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Yep. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Additional questions? Councilmember Flaherty. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of short questions with regard to the parking cash out pilot that was mentioned. Um, first, will that be planned for? Um, employees citywide or, or specifically at City Hall? Is that known at this point? Uh, I believe right now we're specifically targeting City Hall since it's a pilot program. And then depending on, we'll report back out on you know, the, the results of that and, and then um, speak with the council and see if it's something that we want to roll out to all uh, city facilities. Okay, thank you. And the follow-up, um, how, how many, approximately how many employees uh, work at City Hall? Uh, if uh, Caroline is still on the call, I do not call offhand. I, I, I wouldn't want to guess on that. I don't want to guess either, but I will do a quick count and see the answer. Okay, or a, or a rough approximation. I mean, within give or take fifty would be would be helpful. But if you'd rather not commit to a number, that's okay. <laughs> I'm not a good guesser. <laughs> okay, but I'll get you an answer. Thank you. Additional questions, Mr. Councilmember Flaherty, did you have another or? No, thank you. Any additional questions before we go to public comment? Okay, seeing none, let's go to public comment. And just again, by way of reminder, the public comment portion of these deliberations will constitute the statutorily required public hearing on the city budget for 2022. If you'd like to offer public comment, um, please use the raise hand function in Zoom. That will either be under participants or reactions or the more button, depending on which version you have. If you are dialing in by a cell phone, star nine should get you to us. Or if those things don't work, um, please just send a message in chat and our meeting host will um, add you to the queue. And if, as always, if there's more than one person on a single device, please let us know that uh, so we can ensure that everybody gets their full amount of time. So with that, Mr. Lucas. Not seeing any requests uh, quite yet. Just give it a little more time. Anything, Mr. Lucas? Not that I see, no. Okay, please let us know if that changes and we'll go from there. So. Seeing no public comment, let's come back to council for additional questions. And seeing none, let's go into final council comment. Or seeing none, is there a move to pass? Council member Piedmont Smith. 
I think Council Member Rosenbarger was first. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. Council Member Rosenbarger. Thank you. It's okay. I feel like either way I'll get in there. I have a final comment. I didn't have it all the way written out. That's why it took a minute. Um, right now I am um, voting no on this budget. So I want to say that first. Second, I guess I want to say thank you to Mr. Underwood, the mayor, the deputy mayor, and the department heads for doing all of this work and for meeting with so many council members and answering so many questions over this process from the last few months. I know it's been, I mean, I submitted a lot of questions. I've seen a lot go through our emails. So um, I really appreciate the work that has gone into this budget. Um, for now, I'm not in a place to support this budget. And um, I guess I just want to like high level talk about why some, some of my colleagues and I got together and drafted uh, our priorities um, for the 2022 budget. And those, those were due July 1st. I want to back up a little bit and just say, I was looking at my notes from the last budget cycle. And I, I will say, I appreciate some changes that were put in place this year. Last year, there wasn't really a process for submitting priorities. And this year we had we had a deadline for that. And I think it really made a difference in um, initiating and encouraging conversations about what council members wanted to see in the administration's budget. So I really appreciate that difference from last year. Okay, so um, a few council members and I got got together and made a priorities list for the 2022 budget that had um, 13 items on it. Over the course of many meetings with the administration and department heads, you know, um, we whittled that list down to our top four budget priorities that we thought were doable in this budget. And the administration had asked us to also uh, if we could find sources of places to cut funding, if we were, you know, asking for funds for something else. So we did that as well. And um, I would say of our four, of the initial 13, it sort of turned into 15, I think, after the budget hearings and after we had a clarification of some of our questions that we asked. Um, I think there's between two, two and four that made it into this budget. And for me, having this the short list of four um really is something i want to see these are i think things that um, the city is potentially behind on and needs to spend spend money on one is the um a director of climate action in some way shape or form another one is the multi-use path at cascade that was bonded um the other is a parking cash out program. So very happy to see that getting implemented at City Hall. And then another one is um, 800,000 for bike ped because uh, it seems like we are grossly behind in the transportation plan, high high priority bicycle network. And, you know, we have a list of sidewalks that need to be built for connectivity that right now would take, I think, a decade. Um, I think there's talk about potentially bonding for that. But I, for me, until I see these, priorities really laid out um, in this budget. I'm just, I'm going to have to vote no. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments? Council Member Piedmont Smith, I'm sorry, my fault. Yes, thank you. Um, and I, I would like to thank Mr. Underwood and all the department heads and uh, Mayor Hamilton and uh, Deputy Mayor Griffin, uh, Griffith, um, Griffin, who <laughs> met with us. And I do appreciate um, all the meetings and, uh, and all the time that was taken to address our budgetary questions. Um, I still feel like the budget process is not, um, is not uh, as welcoming of uh, council member input as it could be. Um, I, uh, it's just, you know, I don't blame anybody in particular. I think the process is difficult here in the state of Indiana, but the fact is that, uh, we are nine council members elected by residents to 
represent them. And um, the budget is the, the biggest piece of legislation every year through which we do that. And we represent um, what uh, we feel is best for, um, for the community as far as how we spend their, their money, basically tax dollars. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very important undertaking and it's crucial that all nine of us have uh, input into this budget and, and have a way to, um, to craft changes after the initial proposals come through. Uh, I think we, um, by we, I mean both the council members and the mayor's administration have done better this year than last year. And um, I do appreciate that all the way around. Um, as uh, council member Rosenbarger said, um, a group of four council members, uh, which I was also a part of, um, had an initial uh, memo uh, on July 1st to the mayor's and his administration about our priorities. Um, after the budget hearings, um, we uh, kind of reformulated those into four uh, must do um, items that uh, we wanted to see in the budget before we could support the budget. And unfortunately, um, three of them are not in this budget proposal. So um, I cannot support the budget as it stands currently. Um, the position of uh, um, a director of, of climate action is something that I've been advocating for for years. And I think it, it is absolutely necessary for us to uphold our commitments um, to the crucial issue of, of climate action. Um, and uh, the, the other ones, uh, Councilmember Rosenbarger already, already mentioned them. Um, the, uh, the commitment to uh, bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure uh, that was prioritized in our transportation plan does not seem to be at the level to actually fulfill the goals of that plan in the time period indicated. Um, now, I, I, feel, I do feel confident that uh, we're going to um, explore other revenue sources in order to uh, implement some of those goals, um, but uh, there's no commitment at this point. So uh, um, that's, that's a concern of mine. And then the, the multi-use path from Cascades connecting that park on our Northwest side to um, Miller Showers Park uh, is something that uh, the Bicentennial Bonds were supposed to fund. Um, and the engineers uh, discovered that this was very difficult, but it's still in our transportation plan and it's still a very important um, point of connectivity uh, to get to our schools and to connect our parks and uh, also for just for transportation uh, uh, to the city, to the downtown uh, without using car, which is something we need to gradually shift to uh, those of us who can. So um, I will be voting no tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments? Council member Volan. I'm only going to say that uh, my colleagues who have spoken speak for me as well. Thank you. Thank you. Council member Sandberg. Or, yes, go ahead. Thank you. I certainly have reservations about this budget that I've already voiced my concerns. But at this point, I will be supporting the budget as a whole um, with just the caveat that I will be watching. I will be watching to see um, how responsive um, things will go uh, as, as we move forward with some of the areas where we have all expressed our dire concerns and where we would hope for better prioritization for the essentials. And I think there certainly is room to take a look at that and come back to the table and be respectful of what uh, the public wants and what the majority of this council who does represent um, constituents in the city. We don't um, always hear from everyone, but those who do take the time to reach out to us, I think we have a pretty clear signal from many of them uh, where their discontent is. And so once again, I feel like I've done everything I can over the past several years, and uh, I will now sit back and see how it all unfolds. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Smith, and then Council Member Flaherty. Thank you. I'm going to be supporting the budget. Um, I think we've made some really excellent progress. And um, government is incremental in nature. So I I'm really happy that we did make some forward progress on different issues. You know, our work's not done, but um, I think we can all feel pretty good that, that we did make some forward progress um, on issues that we care about and for our constituents. So um, that's about all I wanted to say. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. And then Council Member Flaherty. Thank you. Um, I won't reiterate things at a, at a sort of deep programmatic detailed level um, because some of my colleagues already sort of did uh, where I share priorities. I could speak at length about why I have those priorities and why I think they're um, needed in, in the near term. Uh, but I'll just speak to a few higher level things. Uh, one is, is again, um, I think we did see some process improvements this year. Um, uh, I think there's a lot of room to go yet on that front, but at least uh, a little bit of a step forward in terms of a slightly more formalized process um, for submitting priorities and even potentially questions in advance of the budget hearings. Uh, it's a tricky prospect to work together through this because there's back and forth. I think there was a, a little bit of um, perhaps frustration is, is an appropriate word uh, on behalf of the mayor or perhaps his his team uh, for what seemed to them like shifting priorities um, in, in September. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that A, that was in response to answers to questions received uh, and the outcomes and, and learning from the budget hearings in August, and, and B, that I think um, it's appropriate and, and really fundamental and necessary for us to be able to uh, respond to the budget hearings and the, the answers to questions to understand uh, exactly how to, to give a more detailed uh, uh, look at, at what it would take to get our support for a budget um, at a more specific and less general level. So. Uh, there were some priorities shared in, in um, July, for instance, um, around significant progress on the climate action plan and around uh, increased investment in sustainable transportation infrastructure. And I asked some some very detailed questions about um, about those things. And I think the first set of answers we got weren't weren't quite the level of detail I, I had been expecting. And I think maybe I wasn't clear enough. So I followed up with a second set of questions. Um, that laid out in much, much more, with much more um, clarity, the exact items I was expecting for each uh, particular um, year or project, as the case may be. And and I appreciate and and very much um, want to say thank you to the staff members and staff who spent time putting those together. I know it's a, a big ask, uh, but this is, of course, is a, a big decision and a big budget. And our responsibility and duty as elected officials is to represent our constituents and be true to. Um, the values we ran for office on and the values of this community as reflected in our adopted goals and plans. And I guess that gets to the point, which for me is really the driver of, of my budget decisions and, and budget priorities, um, which is our, our community goals and, and values as defined in our plans. Uh, we do a really great job in this community um, developing those things. And I think we have some great plans in place. Some of them are quite ambitious. Uh, some of them are uh, challenging to the status quo at times and, and may be met with pushback from members of the community. Um, but there's a, a bit of a difference between um, the planning stage when we're develop, co-developing the vision for our community, what the goals are, where we're headed, and adopting those plans through a democratic process. And then when it comes time to implement, you know, whether or not we should be relitigating each progressive step forward, um, and I say that specifically in reference to the Cascades um, uh, issue and uh, the multi-use path that we've committed to in multiple plans and resolutions. Um, so to me, some of the most pressing uh, issues we have in relation to the Climate Action Plan in particular um, and the things contained there are we're not doing enough to meet the ambitions that we've set for ourselves. And I think there are reasonable ways uh, that, that I and some others have identified to, to take meaningful steps forward on that, on that front. And I, I would still need to see those to 
uh, for this to be a civil city budget that I could support overall. Um, and, and the reason I think it applies to the whole budget is because it's so cross-cutting um, and, and these things are kind of disparate in their areas. Uh, so I will also be voting no tonight and remain very open uh, to more conversations with the mayor and his team trying to find uh, a civil city budget that uh, both of us can support. So thank you. Thank you. Additional round one or any round for that matter. Council Member Sims. Thank you. Um, I will support this recommendation tonight um, moving forward. Um, I won't get into a bunch of details. I will piggyback on Council Member Sandberg and I will say that I share some of the same caveats that she listed. Um, and there is much work ahead for us and much more discussion. Um, if I can, just for a second, um, I'd like to acknowledge some comments I heard from my colleagues tonight, um, in particularly about the budget process and some of the process improvements. Um, I heard that it's uh, in, the, in the past, it hasn't been as welcoming as it could be, um, but it's gotten better. Um, some of the process improvements have gotten better. Um, as a vice president last year, we heard some of those concerns loud and clear. Um, I really just wish even last year that I just stepped up more robustly um, to have some impact on more this year. Um, so we kind of came lately this year with the help of Council Member Scambellari and our council staff, uh, Mr. Lucas and Ms. Lake. Um, and don't forget, we also had kind of a, a different budget advance. We really didn't have it because we had a presentation on our book funding. Um, but one of the things that I like to do, and again, uh, we'll touch base with our colleagues as we can, but the budget process next year and some of the process improvements, I think it would serve us better to elongate that process. Um, one of the things that have four days in a row of those presentations, I, I think is uh, we can do better than that. Um, so that's part of it. I'm sure there's some other parts of my colleagues um, would like to see maybe from a communication standpoint, from a um, uh, let's just work things out standpoint. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, we don't know who the president will be next year, but however, this year's president needs to do some work with the council staff and with his council colleagues in order to work on the council schedule and the council calendar next year, which some of these um, spaces and order and, and processes can be included for next year. So that's one of the one of my personal goals before the end of the year. I'll depend on you all um, for your input to help keep improving this process. Um, uh, last thing I will say is, you know, we don't have a perfect budget. Um, we're making some good strides along the way. There are some areas that I'm sure there's some disappointment, um, some give and take, you know, some compromise here or there. Um, and we'll, we'll be watching. We'll be keeping some eye on some things. But I will support this budget and... Uh, I didn't get a lot of the, well, I didn't get. There was some work and some discussions. Um, I could have been happier, but my unhappiness with some of the things is not enough for me to issue the entire budget um, as we move forward. So um, thank you for allowing me to comment, Ms. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Sims. Additional comments from anyone? I think that's most of us. Okay. Is there a move to pass? Oh, I'm sorry, Council Member Volan. So this is round two. So. Yeah, I said one sentence before, so I'll just say one more sentence now. Uh, I also concur with everything Council Member Flaherty said, and with the exception of his recommendation tonight, uh, I concur with everything that Council Member Sims said. Thank you. Thank you. Recommend do pass. Second. Thank you. Okay.
Cunningham. Council Member Rollo. Epstein. Council Member Volan. No. Council Member Rosenberger. No. Council Member Sims. Yes. Council Member Flaherty. No. Council Member Piedmont Smith. No. Council Member Smith. Yes. Council Member Sandberg. Yes. And I, Council Member Scambaluri, will abstain. That leaves three yes, four no, two abstain. Did I get that right? Yes. And is there any other business yeah. for? I see nothing on, on our agenda. I'm sorry. Uh, Ms. Chair, can you can you repeat that? Vote oh, total? I'm sorry. That's okay. um, three, yes. Four, no. And two abstentions, two pass. Thank you. Anything else for the good of the order? And seeing Mr. Lu Mr. Lucas is waving his hand. Yes, just uh, just a bit of information for for the council and the members of the public on the call uh, tonight's uh, votes were recommendations on each of the uh, items on the agenda. Uh, the council is scheduled to have its adoption meeting on these items uh, in two weeks on October the 13th. And at the moment, uh, that meeting will be conducted on zoom. Uh, certainly if the governor's uh, health emergency declaration is not extended. Uh, that meeting will also uh, be held in person at, at uh, City Hall and Council Chambers. So uh, please look at the Council website for the most up-to-date information on how that meeting will be conducted. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Any other business? If not, we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank all. you. Good job, Council Member Scambler. Nice job, Sue. Yeah.